I would like to call to order this uh, Board of Assessment Review, Tuesday, May 22nd, 2018. May we have a roll call, Tracy? Mr. Chamberlain? Here. Mr. Herrick? Here. Mr. Peoples? Here. Mr. Parkinson? Here. All right, thank you. Could we rise and the Pledge of Allegiance? Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, Indivisible, liberty and justice for all. All right, first order, we need the approval of the minutes of April 10th, Board of Assessment Review. Uh, we have a uh, motion to approve the minutes. Make a motion to approve the minutes. I'll second. All right, any, all, all in favor? Any questions? All right. Good. Well done. All right, we are here for the um, the hearing. Uh, Donald uh, Petrin and et al. Uh, we it has been sent back to us from the Superior Court. Is that correct? That's correct. So for um, another bite at the apple, I guess for us. To figure something out and so what we'd like to do what I'd like to do tonight just to set the ground rules is um, and for the sake of time I think so since there'll be no new evidence um, just positions that we take roughly about a half an hour per side to discuss to talk to us about where you're where you're coming from in your position okay um, if you if it needs to be goes a little bit more than that then that's fine. We'll be flexible on that, but I'm more trying to like condense it and keep, keep the focus and and uh, keep it at a reasonable time. And then what we'll do is the board may have questions. We'll ask questions as we go along uh, of you, and then we will um, go into our deliberation. All right, at that point. Darwood, anything? Okay. All right. Mr. Schumann, I have a question. What's that? Can I, oh, I just like to confirm that, that we're just this is a, since it's a remand, everything that was put in evidence the first time around is still in evidence now and still for the board's consideration. Just want that on the record if, if the board can confirm that. Okay, great, and that's that's true. It is. All right, Mike. Uh, and I just want to confirm. I, I absolutely agree with that. The, the record, the exhibits that we had before, uh, but as I've indicated, we have just two brief witnesses and, and additional exhibits which go to part of the court's remand uh, on the interest calculation. Um, so we were just going to offer those. Again, those would be quick witnesses and a couple exhibits. Okay. And I think you'll be going first. I, I believe that's, that I believe that's the last the time. That's, of that's the, that's the order of the uh, draw here. So maybe that's something you can stipulate with the opposing side, those quick witnesses. You mean in terms of whether they testify? Uh, or whether, the evidence. Whether we summarize it? Yeah. Um, Maybe you could summarize it. And Let's put it this way. I, we can certainly go based on the exhibits, if that's your preference, and oh. I can just walk through the exhibits. Is that is that what you're suggesting? I'm just trying to think of it as a way that the opposing counsel would, if they heard what you were offering, they might agree rather than having to put the witnesses on. The uh, We've already uh, shared the exhibits. Mm -hmm. So if we're stipulating two exhibits, um, I can certainly, I think, argue based on what's in the exhibits, and, and we can we can do it that way. That saves two witnesses getting up. So again, the exhibits are in the packet that we sent to you, and if you'd prefer, I just refer to those and save putting witnesses on. Um, that's fine with me. Long, I don't care how you do it, as long as you uh, do it within half an hour. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, and, and, and in that case, certainly, I think I can probably skip through because. The, the questions for the witnesses are fairly straightforward. It's okay. pretty much reading through the documents. I'll just do that. So. All right, then. I'll let you go. Okay. So um, let me just make sure I understand before you start the clock. So this is, you just want a summation, basically the closing argument, 30 minutes to, to argue, and then we're done. Well, everybody un understands where we are procedurally. Uh, this case went to the main Supreme Court. Uh, no, the I'm, Supreme not, Court I'm not going through back that. Back to the, the Superior yeah. Court. Superior Court has issued a 17-page, 16-page decision. 
uh, with some instructions, and we're trying to work our way through Gotcha. That. All right. I, I'm going to stand if you don't mind. It's probably a little more comfortable. Right. But just um, obviously, our uh, we submitted the memo, which you've had a chance to read now for a month or so. And, and frankly, a lot of what I'm going to say has been included in that memo, so I'm sure you've taken the time to, to read it. Um, I just want to go through a couple of the, uh, the exhibits, um, which are again in this packet. Um, and the first is exhibit seven, which is a spreadsheet. Uh, and uh, Ruth Porter would have testified uh, as a finance director, tax collector, how this spreadsheet was put together, um, but I'll summarize it. Back in October of 17, after your original decision, uh, the town uh, looked at the order on the 8% abatement um, and uh, the order on interest payments, uh, and they created the spreadsheet, which shows all of the taxpayers that are parties in this case. Uh, and so for each year, 2012-13, through uh, the 15-16 year, every party that was a, a party to this case, and you'll see some blanks where, people, where parties dropped out, uh, were included in the spreadsheet with their property values. For each year, you'll also see uh, there's a line which shows the less than the 8% abatement that was uh, ordered by you in May um, of 17. Um, and then there is... Uh, uh, two lines over, actually the fourth column in each, uh, each cell uh, is the date that it was overpaid. Um, so uh, the town calculated when the final 8%, the final 50% actually in the town of Scarborough was paid um, on their taxes. So that's the last date when they paid the last 8%, which was the overpayment based upon your abatement of uh, 8%. So you'll see a column for each individual taxpayer, this isn't aggregated, this every single taxpayer has the date that the town received the overpayment. Um, so then there's a calculation of the interest uh, in, uh, in the next column, um, and then the interest in principal for each year, and then way over in the right-hand column, uh, to the extent it's important, um, is the total for each taxpayer. So each taxpayer got a check in the amount of that far, far right-hand column. Um, because a few parties had dropped out, uh, the total dropped a little bit to $380,000 total. Uh, with interest, uh, it was about $461,000. So that's what Exhibit 7 shows. That shows the actual date uh, of overpayment um, and how the interest was calculated. Um, I'll explain uh, in a bit why that's important. Exhibit 8, um, very quickly, is the same spreadsheet. It was run again uh, as it's indicates right above the 3%, uh, right above the Exhibit 8 sticker. Uh, it was run again at 3% interest to show what the change in, uh, in payments would be. Uh, with respect to the 3% question, which I'll talk about a little bit more um, in a minute, uh, if you look at Exhibits 1 through 6, they're all very much the same. Uh, those are budget orders for fiscal year 13 through 18. I'll start with Exhibit 1, and I'm not going to go through all of them because they are essentially the same. But if you turn to tab number 1 or Exhibit number 1, the third page, uh, the next to last paragraph, uh, it just shows that the council voted in accordance with main statute to uh, set repayments uh, uh, to taxpayers on overpayments of their taxes at 3% interest. You might recall at closing argument last time back in May, there was a lot of discussion about what the interest rate was, uh, and one of the exhibits said it was 7%. Uh, when sh around the time that the payments were made at 7%, again, that's exhibit 7, there was a realization that the council had, in fact, actually voted every single year, and that's exhibit 1 through 6 uh, that's applicable here, that overpayments would be repaid at 3%. Um, and I'll explain how that applies in just a moment. Um, so where we are, essentially... Hold on a second, Mike. Yep. Um, you've heard that initial presentation from council. There's... We completely disagree. You do? No. We're yeah. going to address, we'll address that one. Okay, yeah. so those, uh, those, uh, okay. Well, we don't care about the exhibit. That, that okay, the exhibit, yeah. obviously they're in the evidence, exhibit, but you're going to have a different... conclusion, we disagree. Okay. Yeah. So yeah. They have the chance to. to they don't need to, to put their witness on to, to authenticate those witnesses. Okay. 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 Thanks. Yeah. That was that was my understanding. So that's the explanation of, uh, in a nutshell, what those exhibits are. So you have that information in the record, uh, in front of you. Um, 
But in terms of where we are in this case, so I'd say this is, is more of uh, what you might call the, the argument portion. Um, obviously, as we indicated in our brief, we believe that your decision back in May was absolutely correct. That's what we argued for. Um, it was an 8% abatement uh, for the reasons that we indicated then. Uh, I'll point out, uh, and I believe you have, uh, have received the decision from the Superior Court, as, as Darwin mm -hmm. referenced. You'll notice that nowhere in that decision does Justice Horton indicate that anything close to a 32% uh, abatement is correct. Our position going forward is that your abatement of 8% in May of 2017 was absolutely correct, uh, and we will stand by that. And just so I don't confuse you with the interest question, we did not appeal the interest question because at the time we thought the 7% was correct. So if your decision is ultimately upheld, we're not arguing that 3% interest applies to your May 2017 decision. However, going forward, at uh, the time that we made the payments in October of 2017, the opposing counsel raised an issue with the timing of the, uh, the interest calculation. Their argument being that some people pay their taxes uh, in Scarborough half in the fall, half in, in, in March. We had a disagreement over that. Your decision in May said, um, essentially that the parties will work it out, it's sort of a simple calculation. Um, that was almost a direct quote, I think, from the other side. So we thought we had it figured out. Apparently there was disagreement. Apparently, before oral argument, uh, which was November of 17, the opposing side raised that. They didn't raise it in their uh, initial complaint and appeal. Apparently they raised it by letter to the judge and it came up during the hearing. We did not receive a copy of that letter. I still haven't seen a copy of that letter. It was a, a, a separate communication to the judge. I understand there was a letter, but we've still actually never seen it. But they raised that issue. You will see in the judge's decision, it's at the bottom of page 15, just a short paragraph where, again, without a lot of um, illustration or, or detail, he sends it back to you to calculate interest based upon an overpayment. He, does, he doesn't side with either of us. He doesn't really interpret when the date of overpayment is. Uh, our position is that the overpayment is when the last 8%, say the last 50%, but that includes the last 8% of the uh, overassessed taxes, is paid. That's what Exhibit 7 shows. That's the only evidence that you have in the record of an actual date of overpayment. Um, taxpayers have the burden to show something different. The only date of overpayment that you can rely on is what's in Exhibit 7 and, and Exhibit 8. So, to the extent that you now have to recalculate your 8% abatement that we argued for, and that's what the, the judge has told us to do, you can also calculate the date of the overpayment. You can determine that, and you can determine the, the correct interest rate. And the reason that we put in Exhibits 1 through 6 is, at this point, if you're asked by the court, which you have been, to recalculate interest, you can recalculate it based on the correct interest rate. Again. If the decision from May of 17 holds, we're not going to argue. Uh, but at this point, we've been told to, to come back and look at it and look at the interest calculation. So what did Justice Horton do when he remanded it to you in that 16, 17-page decision? Um, and uh, as, as we've referenced um, and the judge referenced, he made a suggestion that rather than taking the amount of the benefit that uh, um, all the adjoining taxpayers uh, receive in dividing that, that one should take the average that they received because there are more taxpayers on the plaintiff side here who are appealing. And the way that was expressed, I think, in the decision and, frankly, at oral argument, uh, the two sides submitted supplemental briefs, and it didn't make a lot of sense because, as I think you might hear from the other side, if someone who has a $700,000 property receives $1,500 in an abatement, and somebody with a $4 million property receives $1,500 because they get the same average amount, that doesn't really make sense because it's not equitably adjusted based upon uh, the, uh, the valuation of the property. So what we have done for your benefit um, is uh, we prepared Towns Exhibit 9, which is the last page, the last exhibit in our exhibit packet. And you might recognize the top part of that, which uh, the first line, which is aggregate tax dollar savings for participants, that was in ex Exhibit 1 from the hearing before, and Exhibit 15. 
So 116,000, 125,000, et cetera, across. That's what the people who had adjoining lots received as a benefit, and that's how we argued to come to 395,000 in the right-hand column, which was roughly 8%. Mm -hmm. So what we've done is based upon the decision and all the argument. For the first two years, there were 37 adjoining lot taxpayers. Um, you'll remember 18 dropped out, so that number went down to 19. So we've just divided, as the court said, to get an aggregate savings per year per taxpayer in the program. And again, I think if you just gave that same benefit to everybody on the taxpayer side, it wouldn't make sense. So what we've done is then calculated that out times the number of plaintiffs in the case for each of those years. And again, that number may have fluctuated, but th these are the most accurate numbers we have. And for those 53, 46, 46, and 47 taxpayers, the total abatement based on the average per year would come out to 698,000 over the course of those four years. So I think the one way that the bar could do this if you chose to follow Justice Horton's remedy is to use that 698,000. Just as we use 395,000, we backed into an 8% abatement. Uh, 698,000 equates to a 14% abatement. If you have a question on my math, uh, there was an Exhibit 9 before, Towns Exhibit 9, which was 19.64%. That was uh, a number that we had thrown out as a possibility. Again, using that number and the total abatement there. You said it's 14%? That one was 19, but 14 is what uh, Justice Horton's remedy would come out to roughly if you did an abatement based upon all the evidence that would equate to 698,000, that would be roughly 14,000 per taxpayer who's complaining here. So that's what we provided well, in 14,000 per taxpayer. Uh, uh, 14%. Sorry, 14%. Yeah, sorry, misspoke. Thank you. Thank you, Derwin. So I think it's important because the, uh, the taxpayers uh, here, I think, are going to continue to argue that they're entitled to 32%. That's the only remedy. That's the argument that they've made all the way through. That's all that they've really submitted to you here. Um, I do think it's important. Again, we referenced it in our brief. Um, but the Superior Court on page 10 and 11 said uh, that Justice Horton agreed that using the money saved by the people in the adjoining uh, lot program, using that as the foundation for the calculation is actually a reasonable starting point a reasonable remedy. And that's what we did the last time around, where the judge differed with our interpretation, was to say that there are more taxpayers than there were lot owners. Adjoining lot owners, more taxpayers appealing, therefore they should get more. Now, I will argue uh, continuously that their damage, as you heard last time um, in the last round of hearings, was all of $13,591. So to be appropriate, which is what the law court sent this very case back to you for, for an appropriate abatement, to be reasonable, which is what the statute says, to be clear and certain, to be meaningful, which is what the, the U.S. Supreme Court case has said, you can still get to $395,000 plus interest. I think all of those factors qualify. I think what Justice Horton was saying was he, he thought it was maybe a little more reasonable if you did it this way. It would equate to more money. He has a point that when there are more taxpayers who are appealing than there were taxpayers who, who benefited, that that can skew the results. But frankly, if there's only one taxpayer um, uh, who uh, was, was harmed in this, then they can get a different abatement. The whole point is, and we've argued this to the court and, and to you, is that it, uh, it needs to be reasonable. It needs to be flexible. So again, the 395 was reasonable. Um, but in this case, the court has sent it back for you to consider uh, Justice Horton's remedy, uh, and you can do that by uh, coming to a 14% abatement. Again, it's important that uh, Justice Horton wasn't calculating the percentage, but at no time does he ever in his decision suggest that 32% or 99% or other numbers that the taxpayers had advanced were the appropriate remedies. Again, he frankly said that the starting point that we argued for and that the, the bar used uh, of the benefit that the, uh, the 37 adjoining lot owners uh, received is a good starting point. So again, the fact that the taxpayers, there are more of them and they have more value in most of their properties than a lot of the adjoining lot owners, 
That again could re lead to a very unreasonable result because uh, if you apply uh, a higher percentage to folks with more valuable property, um, that leads to a skewed result, which would skew it just the same way I think as Justice Horton was concerned about by only having um, a few taxpayers in the adjoining lot program and 50 or more uh, plaintiffs. That can skew it one way, but again, when you have people who have more valuable property, their remedy is so much more than the actual benefit that was uh, uh, in, in, uh, received by the adjoining lot owners that that therefore makes it unreasonable. Um, so again, you can back into, back into these numbers. You can reformulate what Justice Horton has asked you to look at to come to 14%. We noted in the brief, um, in one of the footnotes in, my, in our brief, that uh, uh, you'll note that the 14% coincidentally is very similar to, I think it was Exhibit 7 uh, in the last hearing, which is the abatement back to 2011 uh, values, that's exactly what these taxpayers asked for all the way up through. Um, in the exhibits, uh, we, we submitted the arguments that they made before the bar and before the law court. They were asking for 14%, 14%, 14%, completely coincidentally. I don't believe there's any chance that the judge sort of fell into the $698,000, 14% abatement because he didn't even try to do that math. But very coincidentally, 14% would be exactly what these taxpayers asked for uh, in the very first go-around, which was before I was involved. So um, there's, there's a little bit of symmetry there. But again, I believe that the bar that you made the appropriate uh, decision back in May, um, we will continue to defend that decision. But if this, this board decides to go with an abatement along the lines of what the judge has articulated, again, the interest calculation should run from the date of the final overpayment, because that's what the statute says. Interest runs from the date of overpayment, and you don't have an overpayment until you pay the last 8 or 14%. And the interest rate that the judge has told you to calculate should be 3%, because yes, we made an error. Uh, it was put in the spreadsheets at 7%. There really wasn't a lot of discussion. And again, you'll recall, like the Durwood, uh, was asking questions and there was a lot of confusion around the interest rate. The fact is we've now ironed out exactly what that interest rate should be. So if you're going to order a different abatement than 8%, then I think you ought to order the abatement with, uh, with the correct 3% interest rate. Um, so that's all I had. If you had other questions for me um, or if you want to ask me questions after, uh, after the other side goes, I'll take it either way. Okay. Right, thank you, Mike. Uh, any questions right at this point? <clears throat> Do you know where the confusion came in from 7%? Yeah, it, it was actually, it really wasn't in the evidence other than, and I can't tell you exactly the exhibit, um, there were, um, there was one exhibit where interest was calculated and had the 7%, and that came from uh, one of our exhibits, okay. town exhibit. And the, and the confusion is actually just, the statute says um, that Overpayments will be repaid at the statutory rate of, of 7%, which is the rate the taxpayers pay the town if they're delinquent, mm -hmm. unless the town sets a different rate, which can be as low as 4% lower, I believe. That's how we get to 3%. So I think the assumption at the time was that it was based upon the statute, and no one looked at the, the budget orders um, and realized that actually the town had every single year and continues to set uh, a 3% interest rate. So that's where the confusion came in. Is that in here anywhere? I didn't notice that. Did What's you? that? The statute? Sorry. No? Yeah, is that in here anywhere? Is it written somewhere where we could see it? Here's no, it's I referenced. Um, it is referenced in our brief. Um, and I don't know how directly quoted. Not that I think you're page, lying. No, no, no. Stretch, but no, no. Just to see it. In page six. Page six. And actually, the argument starts over on. Uh, page five. It's argument section three. But specifically on page six, uh, the very last paragraph of that section talks about um, uh, interest runs begins to accrue from the date of overpayment. Yeah, 
Yes. Actually, so the statute's also referenced in the order, although the language of the statute's not, but maybe Darrell would promote that up. So what you're saying is that's typically how, in this case, a board would determine the interest rate would be based on this? Yes, it's based on, interest is set based on either the statutory rate or if the town sets a different rate. And because the town has set a different rate, that is the rate that you would apply. Okay. And, and it was simply an oversight when we were preparing exhibits. Yeah, we put enough. in 7%. Um, and uh, now that we're back talking about interest, uh, we think that that calculation uh, should be uh, modified. I had a question about um, town exhibit 9. 9, yep. So this is an attempt to put into words in a chart Justice Wharton's suggested solution. Right. And, and to understand that, we're getting away from percentages and we're getting into dollar figures, average dollar figures um, that were saved by each of the participants in each column that's four, four years there. Yes, although again, the reason we backed into a percentage is because I think he, he would have everyone get the same average dollar amount. And I frankly don't think that's appropriate. And the other side has argued they don't think it's appropriate um, because that's based upon a tax payment as opposed to an abatement of the value. Mm -hmm. And so what I'm saying is if you, you do what the judge has said, really down through where it says the total abatement principle per year, yep. which is the third line up, yep. if you take those totals, so you multiply the average that the people in the adjoining lot program save times the number of people who are in this program, you come to a figure which you can then carry forward and back into a percentage, which I think is more equitable and very close to what the judge was saying. Um, it's just the way that he was applying it, if we understood it, would not be fair. And I actually don't think we have a disagreement on that. So you wouldn't be saying, say in 2012, 13, the average, there's 116,000 savings for the participants. Right. And there were 37 participants, and so their average saving was 31.57. Yep. Um, but there were 53 people appealing. Right. Do they all get 31.57? That's what the judge would do. I know, but I just want to understand and, and what no, you're saying. Under this scenario, you aggregate those all the way across and come to a percentage and everyone gets 14% of their value, just like they got 8% of, of an abatement of their value before. Could you also phrase it, though, that everybody gets what's in that column for each year if they appealed in that year? I, I think the problem is if you divide it evenly, I think both sides have an issue with that. And that's because... It's not taking into consideration the value of your property. Of their property. So they're not being treated fairly according to the... the if you have a more expensive property, property, you're entitled to a bigger abatement. Right. Than that. So that's why we've tried to back it into a, a percentage so that it, it applies. And I think it's still, sorry, Gerald, but it applies the same way because, for example, based on Exhibit 7, mm -hmm. if the 8% applies to each year that a taxpayer is in the appeal, then they, they get the value for the year that they appeal. Right. The same and so time. instead of the decision being 8% of the land value, your, your interpretation of the judge would be 14% of yes. the land value yeah. for the years that they appealed. Right. Okay. Right. Thank you. Anything else? Chris, anything else right at this point? No, not no. this point. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Thanks. Well done. Thank you very much. Thank you, Captain. John, please. Yeah, sure. Are you going to start? I'm going to start. Okay. So I'm going to handle the uh, substantive part of this, and then Bill's, Bill Dale is going to take over, probably fill in anything I forget, and uh, then talk about the interest uh, rate thing. So I'm not going to talk about the interest rate in my presentation. I'll let Bill deal with that. Um, so. so I just listened to this. I've looked at the town's brief, and it really reminds me of an old lawyer saying and the saying is, if the law is against you, you argue the facts. If the facts are against you, you argue the law. If the law and the facts are against you, you just argue. That's what's going on here. And I know it's not intentional. I'm sure it's not intentional. But the town has basically misrepresented everything about this case, and particularly misrepresented the Superior Court's decision. 
They're saying that you should just reaffirm what you did before. If you look at this decision, I don't see how you can possibly do that and be consistent with the Superior Court judge's decision. If you look at page 11, the Superior Court says that the board's decision is indefensible as a reasonable abatement. And then says that it's unreasonable later. And you know, it says that it, you, know, you can't render the taxpayers, that the board's decision doesn't, roughly equal, isn't, doesn't render it roughly equal to the favored tax, tax, sorry, favored tax treatment granted to the abutting lot owners. They're asking you to ignore all of that. The court's sitting here saying that what happened in the 8% is unreasonable, indefensible, and yet they want you to do it again. I think that, that at the very least, when you come back, you have to wrestle with what the court did and not just, I don't want to, I mean, I don't think this is what they're asking you to do, but it almost feels like thumb your nose at the Superior Court's decision. Superior Court said it was indefensible. They say that the town, that the court proposed a specific remedy, and I think that's inaccurate as well. If you look at the footnote on page 13, the court said it's not proposing any particular remedy. It's merely throwing out sort of various thoughts about what the remedy could be. Now, you're entitled to, I think, consider that, and I'm going to talk a little bit about why I think you shouldn't go there. Uh, but it's not, it's not a proposed remedy. It's not a remedy that's coming to you with the, the imprimatur, with the, the justification of the court behind it. They're just, he's just talking about a possible remedy. The other thing that they say is that the decision does not favor the taxpayers, that the decision doesn't anywhere say that the 32% is a possible outcome. That's just flatly wrong. If you look at the last two pages of the decision, the court says, you know, I've got this idea that you just take the average tax amount. Taxpayers say, no, it's got to be a percentage. Hmm. I don't really know which one of these is right, but the board has to consider these. That's not saying, oh, the 32%, the taxpayer's analysis is wrong. That's saying it's in the mix. The one thing that the court said was wrong was the prior decision, not the taxpayer's suggestion. So pretty much everything the, the, the town is arguing here is just flatly contradicted by the court's decision. This decision says that you have to consider possible remedies, and they need to put the taxpayers in a position of rough equality to those who are in the program. So I really think, you know, we've, we've gone through this, and it just seems like the town's suggesting the same errors over and over again. I don't really, I don't, they're, they're, they, and I think they're all indefensible, just like the court said. Now, with that said, I think the board does have three options here. So the first option is this one that the, the town wants you to do, and that's to just basically flatly reject the superior court's decision and uh, say, fine, we don't care. It's, uh, we're going to redo what with the 8%. I don't think you can do that and be consistent with the Superior Court. If you do that, you're basically saying to the Superior Court, we don't care what you say. And I don't think that's what this board is, is supposed to do. And I, I don't think that's an outcome that can occur tonight. But the town has suggested it, so I've got to respond to it. And that's all my response is. I think also, though, that, that carried in with that is this strange idea that $13,000 is the extent of the damage to the plaintiffs. And again, that undermines the whole idea of what this case is, undermines the issue of rough equality, which is what the court said you need to meet here. And it's not a measure of the damages. And I thought of an example driving over here that perhaps will illustrate what I'm talking about. Imagine that you have two commercial properties next to each other. Now, I, I know we're talking about residential properties, but I don't think that it really matters. But Commercial kind of makes it easier to understand. That's why I'm using that. You got two commercial properties. They're competitors. They're in business, same business, fighting with each other, you know, trying to make the most business. Town comes in and says to competitor A, you know what? We're giving you a 90% reduction in your taxes. So your taxes go from 100,000 to 10,000. Competitor B says, wait a minute, what's going on? You don't have a basis for this. It's not based on market value. It's an, it's an equal protection violation, because it is, because that's, that's the assumption of my little hypothetical here. And then goes, 
and sues and goes through and wins and finds it's an equal protection violation. You're now asked to remedy this. Well, because both of these competitors are in a big town like Scarborough, the actual dollar amount that competitor B lost because of this $90,000 reduction to competitor A is pretty small. That's the $13,000 number that they're talking about. But you can't sit here and say that that's the harm to competitor B. Because harm to competitor B is that they had to pay $90,000 in taxes that his competitor A did not have to pay. That's what the harm is. And that's exactly the same harm here, is that people in the abutting lot program escaped, some of them, tens of thousands of dollars of taxes every year for no reason. We complained about it, and that is how we've been harmed, is that we have been paying tens of thousands of taxes more some of us, than what those in the budding lot program were. And that's what needs to be remedied, and then that's, the, uh, and that's what the remedy has to accomplish. Now, and that's the harm that has to happen. That's why I think the 8% simply doesn't do that, because the 8%, for all the reasons we've already said before, and for the, the court's decision as well, just simply doesn't work. It's not remedying the harm, and ultimately, uh, it, it doesn't solve the problem. Now, the next option is to give a flat abatement of some variety or to, to uh, apparently the town wants you to do one of two things. One of which is to give this flat abatement at the average dollar amount and then uh, the other apparently they've now backed into a 14%. Well, I want to talk about that first. Backing into that 14% is precisely the same error that the court focused on in the 8% and declared is what made the 8% indefensible because you're dealing with a, a 34 in one and 54 in another, so you're backing into a percentages that are based on differences in class sizes. That's exactly what the courts didn't like about the 8%, and they're asking you to do it again to get to this 14%. You can't do that. Now, Let's talk about what the court's suggestion, because it's not a proposed order, but it is a suggestion. So let's talk about what he's, what he's suggesting. First of all, we disagree with, you know, if you look at the town's Exhibit 9, and you see that number that, three, that, that Derwood was talking about, the 31, 57, and 12, and, and goes up to 40, or 4,091 and 15, 16, which comes to a total of 14,617. Uh, for all four years. We think the actual number is around 17,000. That's just, and the reason why we come to a different number, and this was all mentioned in the prior hearing as well, is that the town is including in this program a number of properties that simply weren't part of the adjoining lot program. For instance, you have, uh, and I forget the name of the property owner, but the one who got the, the farm, got into the farm program afterwards, they include that in the program even though, which means that that person got a zero, a zero dollar reduction. Now, if you include that person in the program, obviously it makes the average seem smaller than it actually is, even though really that zero dollar figure is not indicative of what they received through the program, because what they received through the program is actually the fair market value, not what they got through, through a different program. And if you include that back in, and some others that are like that. For instance, they talk about things in which they, they talked about things at the last hearing about how um, certain properties, when they went back and looked at them, actually were unbuildable, and that's why they were. Well, again, the, the whole scope of this program from day one, as it's, the assessor testified, was that it was a reduction from market value. In other words, people in this program were getting a reduction for no reason. So if you can't include those properties into this calculation because you're including properties that were not part of the program into that calculation and you're artificially lowering what the average is. That's the first thing. The second thing, and I've got a graph. Is that angled to everyone? Yeah. Pardon? Can everyone see this? Yep. Now, this is the same graph that was in the document that Bill Dale provided to you. 
uh, which I think is on page four, which was our joint mediation statement. Um, the only difference is, is that I changed the colors because I was looking at what the colors were in the, the document and I figured it gets blown up, you're not going to be able to see any of them. So the colors are just different, but the numbers and everything are the same. Now, the purple line, which is flat, shows this using an average dollar amount, which is taking the fourteen or $17,000 figure and just applying it uniformly to everyone in the program, or everyone in, every one of the taxpayers. So every taxpayer for the four years gets uh, 14 or we think 17 uh, plus interest. Every taxpayer in the? Our complaining taxpayers. Yeah, okay. Uh, I'll just, us. Yeah. <laughs> uh, now, that creates a flat line. The red is the 8%. The green is uh, what was actually in the budding lot program comparing land to land. And then the uh, blue is a proposed, or we call it 32%, but it's really 31.48%. Now, the thing is that if you look at this, and I think this, this is one area in which the town and the taxpayers actually do agree. And that is that if you try to do this as a, a flat dollar figure, you don't achieve rough equality. And the reason why is, is pretty evident with that, that, that chart, because you really, it's just a flat amount. Whereas if you do look at the green, you'll see that even under the abutting lot program, as your value increased, the overall value of your property increased, the amount that you got back also increased. And we think that's a necessary component of what needs to be done in terms of, of finding a remedy here. Uh, so really, I think that, and I don't think there's a lot of disagreement on this, this one point, but I think that really this, the court's suggested remedy really just doesn't work as a matter of law in terms of uh, putting the taxpayers in a rough equality position. And that leads to the last remedy and the last thing the court can, the board can do. Um, and that's just a, adopt a, a grant a percentage abatement. Now, there are a lot of ways, a town has some statement in it about how we've proposed a multiple, mul multitude of uh, percentages. There are a lot of ways of measuring this. The courts have a lot of ways of measuring this. Town also goes on about how this board has some discretion. And I would agree, but that discretion really lies in figuring out how the program benefited people and then applying that program to us, applying that benefit to the taxpayers in this case. And there are lots of different ways of measuring how that program benefited those in the abutting lot program. You could look at only the abutting lot. Some of the, and you can look at an average of the abutting lots or you could look at just the greatest the largest, uh, abate, uh, largest uh, reduction given. You look at the largest reduction, that's 98%. You look at the average, I think it's like 80%. You could combine the two properties together, and then you could look at the largest, which I think is around 50, or you could look at an average, comparing land to land again. And that's, the, that's where we get the 31.48%. Now, I think the court, the, the, sorry, the board does have leeway within all of that to come up with a resolution. We have proposed the 31.48% for a simple reason, not just that it's the lowest. Uh, in fact, that's not the reason we're proposing it. If we, could, if we thought we had a better argument for the higher one, we'd be going for that. But the reality is, is that, you know, what was in the abutting lot program was kind of all over the place, a lot, although people did get pretty substantial reductions. But you did have to have an abutting lot to get it. So it doesn't seem right to just look at the abutting lot. Um, you can't really look at buildings because the buildings skew everything. So you have to look at only the land. And if you just go to the highest one, although there is some argument, there some court cases talk about the highest one, that seems unreasonable in this case where there's such a, a diversity. So the 31.48% really is what comes down to being uh, the most uh, logical and really the one that's de demanded by the evidence in this case. Now, in looking over this, this has gone on since 2012. And the taxpayers believe that 31 per the 32%, which I'll just, you understand, 31.48, uh, but it's 32%. We think that's the equitable remedy here. We think that's the right legal remedy here. And we think that's also the only way to end this tonight. 
Any other remedy that's proposed is going to lead to the taxpayers continuing this fight. Uh, we think 32% is defensible. We think it should end it because we think there is no way to challenge that legally versus every other proposal that the town has suggested tonight. Every single one, as I've just outlined, leads to, is based on a foundation of, of legal sand. And we think we'll challenge and, and, and we will challenge those. The 32%, though, we think is, is actually the correct number and the one that the board should, occur, uh, should award tonight. And with that, I'll turn it over to Bill. Unless, uh, why don't, do you want to ask questions now or do you um, want, yeah. do you want to wait for Bill to finish? Any questions now before we... I, I have a couple. Yeah. Sure. Um, can you re-explain how you came to this 31%? I mean, what I heard at the end was we should do this to end it. If we wanted to end this tonight, we should do that. I, I don't think the court is telling us we should do anything for that reason. We should do what we think is right as a board. Well, that's, that's, and that's what I'm asking you to do. So how do you come to this 31% beyond so what, just to end it? All right. So what we did is we, t we, f we looked at the properties that were in the abutting lot program. And we looked at, we took the, the assessor's chart which I think is ex our, our exhibit five from the park. In, in the Superior Court record, it says tab. Tab five is a chart. But that's, yeah, that's the, that's the taxpayer's exhibit five. Okay. And so what that exhibit had was the land value and then what Matt Sturgis did after this first Petron decision came down. So you, just to recall, remember what happened back then? You know, Matt was getting ready to commit taxes for 2016, right? Yeah. yeah. And at the week he was supposed to be doing that, the Petron decision came down and said, you can't do this anymore. So what he did was he went back and said, okay, I'm going to change all of these to what I believe to be fair market value. Uh, we don't dispute that what he did was to, to compare it to fair market value. So we took, so what Exhibit 5 does is it takes the land value of the abutting lot, the combined abutting lot programs. So if you had one lot and another lot, combine those to get to, together as land values. We didn't, doesn't consider the building. So you start with that. And then it went and looked at what those combined properties were assessed at by Ma Mr. Sturgis after the Petron decision came by. So to just give one example, and I'll just use some numbers, not actual numbers, or I can... So to use one example on Exhibit 5, we had uh, two properties, one of which was assessed at 52200 that was the abutting lot, and the other was assessed at 121700 And then afterwards, uh, the 52,000 was increased to 111,900 and 121,700. And that meant that under the abutting lot program, they were assessed at 173,900, but afterwards they were assessed at 233,600. So you follow me so far? Mm -hmm. So we did that for every property that was in the abutting lot program, and we calculated what percentage reduction it was, and then we averaged that percentage reduction. Because some people, for instance, the one I just just right. mentioned to you was 25%, um, but others were 42.7, 43%. And yeah. we took those and averaged those together, and that's how we came up with the 31.48%. Is that, you following me? Yes. That, that, no, I, when you said average, that, that gets it. I get, I get that. Okay. Perfect. Thank you. Sure. Um, uh, I, I, John, I have a couple questions. Um, you started off by saying that uh, the judge basically said that our that it was uh, indefensible. Mm -hmm. Is that what he said? He did, didn't quite say that though, did he? Didn't yes. he say that? Didn't he say that the second variable was indefensible, not the first variable? There was, we had there was two. It was bifurcated, so to speak. He said that we, in fact could use a dollar amount, and that was seemed to be an equitable remedy. But the second part of it, our, the way we, uh, our remedy was indefensible. 
So there, there is what the whole thing wasn't indispensable. I just want to, I think that should go on the record. It, it says, however, in the second variable in the board abatement equation, the total number of taxpayers that renders the board's decision indefensible as a reasonable abatement. I think that that is limitation that that is correct as far as the word indefensible, but I think that he also goes through and he says, well, what if they reach the right result but the wrong reasoning? And he said, even under that analysis, it's not uh, it's not an appropriate abatement. And I, I don't want to beat the board up on. I mean, I, you know, you tried to do your best and the court disagreed, and and so I'm not trying to beat you guys up about it. I, I'm more the it's more the idea that you would just go and. And, and really, the comments about indefensibility and all that is more directed to the idea that you would just go and, and do the same thing over again. I mean, that to me, we can talk about you know what parts of it the board the court didn't agree with, but the simple fact is the court didn't agree with it. And then to go and say, well, fine, we don't care, we're going to do it again. That's uh, I would be uh, just even speaking just for myself that that would be uncomfortable for me to do as a board member. You guys are going to do what you're going to do, but that's really what I was addressing more than, than trying to beat up the board's prior decision. Okay. Um, no, and I didn't take it like you're trying to beat us up. I just wanted to, <laughs> I mean, there, there, was, there was two parts of that. Yes, right? yes, I agree with that. Um, the other thing, in, in your example about the two commercial properties together and mm -hmm. the competing businesses and then one gets a 90%. In the, worst, in the worst case here, uh, tax payment while the other goes has to pay the full freight, so to speak. Um, again, that isn't that a is not not quite what happened. I mean, it's almost like the two commercial properties are together. One has a excess lot, while one has an outbuilding, and the outbuilding is taxed at a lower rate than the actual two pro competing businesses. And in, in the course, there's no. Compete, uh, competitiveness here between houses. No, there, there, there's, there's not. I didn't mean to. Say so that. one doesn't have a, a, you know, a competitive advantage over paying less than another person as far as running an ongoing business concern. And that, that I agree with that. But I think that the ultimate point is, is that that even in a residential standpoint, one has more money in their pocket at the end than the other does, and that's really what the harm is. Great. And I think, though, that although I agree with you that, that with the, the back lot and everything, that's, I don't think that really changes the, the fundamentals of the example. Because if you have a, a, a competitive business and it has a back lot that it's only paying pennies on the dollar for, it's getting a competitive advantage by not having to pay full freight on, on land that it owns that its neighbor who's competing with is not. Um, and that... That's a harm, and and really, it's it's you know I understand that there's a little bit of difference because we're talking you know commercial to residential is is a difference. The mo the bigger point though is that if you look at all the cases when they talk about what the harm is, they're really talking about you know, money out of your pocket that someone else or someone else had money in their pocket that you because you were discriminated against didn't have the same access to, and that's what the harm is here. It's not you know and the. I think the other thing too is that, you know, if you're looking at it just in terms of, of taxes that you paid more, in a big town like Scarborough, that's always going to be pennies, and you could have things that are that are just you know someone you know give someone a sweetheart deal where they're paying you know a thousand bucks a, a, is the entire valuation of their property, which is patently illegal, and yet anyone who complains they just say well it's only you know yeah their property should be valued at a million. But given that I think Scarborough's uh, total tax base is in, is in the hundreds of millions, you know, three billion, sorry, hundreds, uh, or 900,000 or 990, a million dollars basically is a drop in the bucket. So it's not going to harm anyone, but that's really not in, in terms of if you're looking at it that way, but that's not the harm. The harm is, is that someone's given a benefit, given an advantage that you don't have and there's no reason for them to be given the benefit. And that's what the equal protection violation that was found here. And that's really what we're, we're arguing about. Okay. Thank you. Bill? I think Derwood had a question. I had a question oh, sorry, uh, uh, quickly about Exhibit 9. Yeah. Uh, you were taking issue with uh, three lines down on the right, four-year sum 
of the figure 14,617. Yes. And you said it, you thought it was worth uh, something more like 17. Do you have an exact number that you would? 17,617 is what we've calculated it to be. Okay, so that would be? Uh, that's for the f four years. Oh, exactly $2,000 more. Okay. Pretty much, yeah. Okay. Oh, three thousand. Three. Three thousand. Yeah. yeah, actually, exactly three thousand more. <laughs> That's just coincidence because we had actually, when we did this, I did a calculation and we thought the town was going to be a little higher than that. But uh. okay, so that would, according to the town's theory of what the Superior Court is saying, that would up the fourteen percent then to whatever three thousand more on on fourteen makes, like a couple more percent on fourteen percent. Right, except we think that, I mean... I know I, you think it should be 31%. Well, no, I, I think you can't back into the 14% because I really think that if you do that, you're, you're replicating the exact same error. That, you know, the second part that we were just talking about being indefensible, that's really what the 14% is, is it's going right back to that exact same error because, again, what was indefensible was taking a certain number of taxpayers who were in the abutting lot program and then applying it to a larger number of taxpayers who were not. So backing into a 14, 15, or whatever percentage you want to use is just replicating the exact same issue, that second indefensible part that the court really didn't found was indefensible. So I don't think you can, I really don't think you can do that based on the court's decision, but, okay? Okay. Bill? You, uh, not counting the taking off the time for, for questions, we have about, uh, 10, 15 minutes. I, I shouldn't be more than a half hour. Okay. <laughs> we'll still be here. Okay. I may not. Right. If I may, Mr. Chairman, I want to address two issues. First, a quick follow-up to John's argument about the just value remedy here, and then second, to talk about the interest rate, since the town has raised that. Um, an issue that seems to be forgotten here is that under Maine law, <laughs> the Maine Constitution, which controls what Maine statutes say, is that the Maine Constitution, like it or not, makes all of these property calculations based on an ad valorem basis. So it's not per capita that Mr. Chamberlain and Attorney Parkinson side by side should pay the same. It's not based on ability to pay that some little old widow who is a school teacher who's got $1,000 a year versus some multimillionaire, a graduated income tax basis. No, neither of those. Maine law and all these property tax discussions, fair or not, but it's Maine law under the Maine Constitution, it's on an ad valorem basis. And so that's why when you look at this, if you want to find what's roughly equal to this green line, it's the blue one, um, which is our 32%. It may strike you as unfair, and indeed lots of people argue from time to time that the main constitution ought to be amended, and it ought to be some sort of graduated ability to pay, like the income taxes. You make a million dollars, you pay more, not just in absolute dollars, but in percentage than somebody who makes $10,000. Okay, so don't forget, this is an ad valorem basis. Um, and that's why, yes, our numbers come out higher. But again, that's main law. Second, I want to talk about the interest rate. Town didn't like the 7%. And you heard the, the, the deal is that by state statute, the town can charge, it's only for taxpayers, one rate, and can charge uh, and pay back people who overpay at a lesser rate if it wants. Town does have it both ways. And Scarborough actually did it. Charges people 7% to be late, um, but only pays people who overpay 3%. It's a bit of a scam, but the state legislature says it's okay. Scarborough does it. Problem is, where would I be without a chart, huh? Problem is, when you engage in an illegal assessment, as the main Supreme Court has determined the abutting lot program to be, an illegal assessment, Guess what? There's a statute that says, Title 36, um, Taxation Section 504, for illegal assessments, it's 25% interest. Just in case you can't read that far. <laughs> I can't. Yeah, please, please should blow it up. Yeah, I blew it up and I got a copy of it. Thank you. 
Um, so if the town of Scarborough doesn't want to stick with the 7%, I want to take advantage of the statutory provision that could pay less. We object. We think by statute, overriding the other provision, if we're assessed illegally, we're entitled to 25% interest plus, because that's our rebate, plus any damages, two or three hundred thousand dollars worth of attorney's fees. So if the town of Scarborough wants to argue about 3%, we're going to argue 25%. Now, if any of you are unpersuaded by that, even though it's pretty straightforward on that statute, and look at the other papers I provided. And I know you have, from time to time, looked at the Maine Municipal Association booklet on administrative procedures. And here's the MMA booklet, photocopy. It's in that paper I just passed out to everybody. When is a tax illegal? Well, there are four or five ways, one of which is an assessment that's based on an unconstitutional assessment. Well, that's us. An illegal assessment. MMA tells you one of the bases is an unconstitutional assessment, we get 25% interest. So the town of Scarborough wants to argue about three, great, because we're arguing 25%. Thank you. Fair enough. Sure. Oh, yes, the other thing I forgot to say is I, I cannot believe, particularly with the town manager here, that the town of Scarborough has taken the position that when they send out tax bills, it has to be paid twice a year. Am I correct on that? pay twice a year in Yes. That people who don't pay the first payment in the fall on time don't need to pay interest until the second due date. I'm pretty sure that's not how the Downs Gabber operates. Maybe I'm wrong, but I think it's pretty clear if the two due dates are, you know, September 1 and March 1, I'll bet if you don't pay the first half on September 1, you get charged interest every day until the second payment's due March 1. So the notion that they're going to compute interest only from that second date is ridiculous because they charge interest if you miss the first date. I live in South Portland, we pay taxes four times a year. I think they're going to move it to 52 times a year pretty quick, but <laughs> we pay it four times a year. And you know why? If you don't pay it on time, you get charged interest. And I'm sure that's what the town of Scarborough does. So to suggest that the interest, be it 25% or the 3% or the 7%, is only going to run from that second date. It's silly, because that's not what you do. Right. Do you have anything that shows that? I mean, if that's true, that's a big deal, right? Excuse me, do I have anything that shows what? That they charge interest on the first one. I, I, I'm sure... I mean, it's a fair argument, but I, I can't use that in my argument. If I you're just... You if I, I'm not going to take your word for it, is what I'm saying. I, I hear that. That's okay. You don't need to. Um... If you look at the exhibits, I'm sure those budget resolves, which, in which the town of Scarborough here, when it passes its budget, says we're going to charge people 7% if they're late, but we're only going to pay them 3% of the overpay. I'm sure that also sets the uh, uh, due dates. I can also um, just, for, I had a couple clients pay late on the first, uh, the first uh, installment for 2012 after the first, uh, the uh, Revaluation occurred, and they were charged interest. And I, I the other thing too is that I, I don't Again, think this is a be, this like, is not while, a, you're, while you're saying that. That's great. I, I Sh have, show but show this, me Chris, something. Chris, Chris, I got it. All right, the towns or the assessors. I'm really the town. The assessors exhibit book for tonight. Yeah. Tab one. The town council alert. Right. If you look down at the bottom of the first page. We have the last full paragraph on that. See this page here? Yep. Last full paragraph. We have further ordered that the total gross budget is $72 million. This total left estimated revenues and other credits of $22 million results in a net appropriation of $49 million, which shall be raised from taxation. The town council further fixes Monday, October 15, 2002, and Friday, March 15, 2013, as the dates upon which the dates upon each of which one half of such tax is due and pursuant to statute with interest to accrue at 7%. And that's on all four. That's what town councils do all the time. And so it's right there in black and white in their exhibit. Yeah, if you don't pay on time on the fall date, it says yeah. after each such date. Yeah, and it says right there after each such date. I can't believe you all can't take some uh, 
judicial notice, if you were, whatever administrative board equivalent is, that you all know you got to pay your first payment on time or you charge interest. It's the time value of money. We all know it. Um, so with all due respect, Mr. Herrick, it's right there in their exhibit one and each one for the following three years. Well, I'd also just, what I was going to also say is I can't imagine this is a controversial position that the town charges interest on, the, on a late payment on the first one and suggests that perhaps the town would just simply stipulate to that because that's what happens. Well, no, but I, I thought you brought it up. That's why I'm asking. Because doesn't that go back to the when we would calculate the percent, when we would start well, calculating it, the percentage? It's in those exhibits. It's in those town council budget results right. each year when they pass the budget. They do the 7% and the 3%, but they also say when the two due dates are. It says right there. Yeah. And the interest, you go on the next page, there. Yeah. It says, yeah, yeah. You know, I see two. it. Yep. It's the way everybody does it. Just South Portland, we get to times four times a year. I'm sure the manager would confirm that pay interest if you pay late. Are we allowed to ask them that or somebody no, show us something yeah, on we'll that? We'll be asking quite a question. Okay. Between, we still get cool. Questions I'd like to hear that. Thank you. Yeah. Um, John, are you just there to make them look good? Or, uh, <laughs> you, that's why you're <laughs> dressing up that, that triumvirate, right? He, he's, on the hair, reading this. <laughs> he's on the hair team. We're on the yeah. <coughs> not so hair team. Okay. Um, you guys are done, right? Yes. Great. Thank you. Okay. Um, questions? Chris, if you want to have more questions, well, why, don't we, why don't we continue on with that, that note and on that interest, so I'd like to I'd like to delve into that, drill, drill that down a little bit further, Mike. Um, why don't you talk to us about that? You heard what they said. Uh, obviously, I think it, it's you know their argument that you know I know any taxpayer would probably uh, wish that we're uh, which <laughs> wish it were otherwise, right? But that's not the case. But so why don't you just talk to us a little bit about not just that, all right, but their. Um, Argument about the um, um, the statute where it's an illegal assessment at 25 percent. Why don't you give us your side of that, please? Okay. So um, a couple things. Um, so on the overpayment again, we've argued this uh, somewhat in front of the court. Argued it amongst ourselves. Uh, the issue is when the overpayment is made. And again, as I explained earlier, on the 8 percent, 14 percent, there isn't actually an overpayment of taxes until you pay that final amount. Um, so that's our position. Um, you could go back to the earlier payment, but I guess I would point out, um, and, and Mr. Herrick was raising it, um, the issue here is that there's no evidence in the record as to what the initial, the first payments were. That's part of the problem, is they have the burden, I think, to, to show you when they made overpayments, and the only overpayment in the record, only date of payment, rather than overpayment, not to confuse it, the only date of payment is an Exhibit 7 or Exhibit 8. So they haven't provided any information from which you could go by any other date. Those are the only dates that are in the record. Um, with respect to um, the, the... Can I stop you right there for yeah. a second? Yeah. Just so I understand it and we're clear here. Your position is that, say the, say the tax liability is $20,000, and it's broken up 10 and 10, and there should be an ab ab abatement based on what's happened of $5,000. So their total tax liability would be fifteen. You right. Following me? Yeah. Yeah. yeah absolutely. So their first payment was ten. So you're saying that since it's they're not they haven't met the fifteen yet, exactly. then the interest ticker shouldn't start until wherever that period is where they pay the, the final payment 10 where they paid in full. And the chicken back. Okay. Yeah. On either side? So they've now paid if they paid the first ten and they gotta right. get to fifteen. Right. You don't pay them interest on that money on the front end either. No, but you wouldn't. Well, you would charge them interest on the opposite. But we wouldn't charge them money. Well, uh, according to the resolve, uh, yes. If there's a late payment, um, they charge interest. But the difference is the way the statute reads, and I think the way the order reads, it's on an overpayment. And our position is you'd haven't overpaid the taxes until the final payment's made. Can we have a chance to respond so, to that at some point? Yep. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. We're, we're going to be going back. No, I, that, I understand so. his point. So, and with respect to the, the issue of the, uh, the new argument about the 25% um, uh, interest, uh, their assessments weren't illegal. Um, the assessments that were illegal, if anything, were the underassessed values of the, uh, the adjoining lot uh, program. So their taxes were not illegally assessed. 
there was an equal protection violation, and I'm going to jump a little bit into some of their argument because, again, they've confused uh, a lot of things and we haven't talked about it. The, the violation that allows them an abatement because somebody else got a better deal is an equal protection argument. But when they talk about uh, equality, that's they're entitled to rough equality on the equal protection side, not on the remedy side. The remedy, what we're here to talk about tonight, and what we were talking about in the court um, uh, several months ago, is a due process issue. The courts have said, what, what, do, what process are they entitled to? What remedy are they entitled to? And that case law on due process has nothing to do with equality. Nowhere does it say rough equality. And I'd also point out, actually, Mr. Peoples, um, you, you raised some questions about what the court's decision was. And again, clearly, based on what we put in the brief, we actually cited to the court's decision, analyzed it, tried to quote it directly, didn't try to paraphrase it. Again, I don't think you'll find anywhere in the decision that the court suggests anything close to 32% is correct. But more importantly, the court noted on page 13, as noted above, using the benefit conferred by virtue of the discriminatory program as the basis for the abatement is a reasonable means, arguably the best means of achieving constitutionally required rough equality. So the court used the term rough equality and specifically said using the benefit conferred upon those adjoining lot owners is the best way to determine rough equality mm -hmm. because it's a dollar figure that they received the folks who benefited versus giving the same dollar amount um, to, uh, uh, to the folks who had different value properties. And again, we're here because people had adjoining lots. The taxpayers did not have adjoining lots. If you remember, the only taxpayer who's appealed who had an adjoining lot actually was part of the program, and they've since dropped out of the case. So these people didn't have the same type of property. They didn't have adjoining lots. So there's a lot of discretion for this board to determine, therefore, what is the best remedy. So again, back to the, the question about the 25% interest, the assessments were perfectly legal when they were assessed against these taxpayers. Their assessments were not illegal. There was an equal protection violation based upon the other taxpayers, and the court has uh, decided that they're entitled to a remedy, and that's what we're here to decide. But it wasn't an illegal assessment. Okay. Can so but, uh, but you guys aren't asking for 25%, right? So yes. we're going back and forth on this kind of becomes irrelevant. Am I correct? No. In you're getting correct. into... You're not correct. Okay. We were here right. and we said 7% and the assessor agreed with it. We went to mediation and the town manager showed up and said, you know... Uh, we're hold on, I'm going to yeah. talk about mediation. Thanks, sir. Yeah. Okay. I'm just going to say that's what... No, I'm no, no. no, 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 no. Uh, uh, Bill, I've got to cut you right off. We're not talking about what happened in mediation. In any event, that was a new argument That's going to taint the, this okay. hearing. So don't do it, okay? Right. Please. We absolutely asked for it. Absolutely an illegal assessment. If we didn't have illegal assessments, the main Supreme Court wouldn't have ruled our way. We wouldn't be here tonight if our weren't the victims of illegal discrimination, a violation of the Equal Protection Clause of the federal and state constitution. Absolutely we are. Well, I think, if I and remember the correctly, when, when, once we decided on that, when we came to a decision, at first there was no interest, right? And then someone said, wait a minute, I think there needs to be interest. Yep. So. Our decision was was void of any interest until it was brought to this this pan, this board, mm -hmm. and then at that point, I think there was some quick research and said seven percent was the number. Right. And we we all, didn't have we this agree. we didn't have this uh, this budget order town budget order in which to base our decision on either. So I think that's that's kind of the how that that number I think came. I think is that a failure? good, bad, or indifferent? I think that's how it came. Is that a failure proof by the assessor? Didn't bring in the budget orders. So not my fault. No, Except no, I'm burden. just, yep, yeah, understood. We're pleased with the 7%. Yep. Yeah. Okay. That was um, my question to you. I just wanted to see if this was part of the argument of what I had to consider. Are we going to 25 or 3 or 7 or whatever? So, okay, fair enough. At 7, we're fine. Okay. So, I, I guess I, I need some clarification on we've got two sides saying the opposite, which is there's an Ill illegal assessment and it's not an illegal assessment. Um, I mean, I'm hearing both sides, I'm appreciating both sides, but I, I, I'm honestly, I'm on the fence because I'm, I'm, I'm hearing good arguments on, on both ends. So I, I, I'd love to hear it without getting into another 20 minutes, a, a few minutes more of why it's illegal, not so much for the obvious, and, and why it's legal. 
So can you restate those for kind of in, in a summation? I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll go first. Start, so and we, you can finish, we Bill. First. Um, but again, uh, the, uh, the interest rate that was determined at the prior statute, uh, at the prior hearing, was based upon the statute. That was why you came to 7%, because again, the statute says Main 7%. Main state statute? Yes. Yeah. 7% as cited in the brief. 7% unless otherwise set by the town, basically. So there's now been a determination that there was a mistake. Um, and as Mr. Dale said, uh, that would have been a burden of proof issue um, had we not come back here. That's why I've said if we stick with the 8% abatement, we're stuck with the 7% because we didn't appeal it. Nobody appealed that issue. They've raised it. It's come back to, to discuss the, uh, the interest rate. Uh, I mean, Mr. Chamberlain, you're exactly right. There are two sides making two different arguments. Um, there has never been raised until tonight, um, not in their brief, not in any other situation, the 25% interest. And again, the, abate, the assessment against these folks was not illegal. It was uh, the incorrect assessment on the other properties um, that uh, was improper. Therefore, they were denied equal protection, um, and uh, they're entitled to a remedy. And so their assessments were perfectly valid at the time they were assessed. Um, but after you compare to the other properties, um, then they're entitled to an abatement. So um, we don't believe that the statute 504 um, applies. Again, first raise now. Um, that's not a statute that applies to this. And again, you'll remember when we got to the 7% before, it was based on 506. Sorry, I think I misquoted. It's actually 504, but it was based on 506. That's what we all argued from before. Was there a decision or comments from the judge about subsection 504? No. Okay. In, in your belief that it's an illegal assessment, condensed is? With all due respect, we wouldn't be here if we weren't the victims of unjust discrimination. The Maine Supreme Court has so held, based upon decisions of the Maine Supreme Court and the U.S. Supreme Court, to say that our assessments were okay, it's just everybody else's were wrong. No, we're the victims of unjust discrimination. So says the Maine Supreme Court. We're the victims of that. That's why we're here. So you, you, you can't say that ours are fine because everybody else is wrong. We're the victims. We're the guys that pay too much money. We're the victims of that unjust discrimination. Thank you. Um, on that, uh, you know, let's stick with this interest room. I have a couple other questions. When in uh, Justice Horton's opinion, mm -hmm. he did have a paragraph at the end about interest, mm -hmm. right? And he said the board appropriately voted to award interest on the abatement at 7% running from the date of overpayment. Um, accordingly, interest on the loans to be refunded each taxpayer due to the abatement should be calculated from the date on which the town received any overpayment for property tax attributed to the budding property program. And that's all he says on that, right? He doesn't mention that it's illegal. Right? I, he as just I says said, that as I said to Mr. Harris, we're pleased to live with the 7%. Okay, I'm just now saying. Now it's probably about 3%. He doesn't address any I, no. illegality no. in what, we, what was done. What, what the assessor said, what we said, and what the board said. We're fine with 7%. Okay. The other, if I could just respond to the date of overpayment issue that got raised before. The, the, the overpayment? Date of overpayment? Date. Yep. Because uh, I, I think we, we also disagree. Um, and I think your example was someone who's supposed to pay 20000 and pays 2 and 10 Yeah. And then instead, of, we're supposed to only pay 15000 Well, the reason why we think you have to look at both dates, and both dates are in the record because both dates come from the, the four exhibits that the town has attached to its brief talking about when the payments are due. Uh, this is all simple. This is not a failure of proof. It's actually in the, the town's provided it. The assessor's provided it in any event. But... If you were supposed to have only paid 15000 there's no question that what you would have done is paid 7500 in the fall and 7500 in the spring. So if you had instead paid 7500 in the fall, you'd be you know, 2500 below the 10 that the town assessed you for, and you'd be charged interest on that. So really what we think, the date of overpayment is the date that you paid more than you were required to, taking that total amount and dividing it into two. So the calculation sounds a little complicated, but I think it actually just is fair. And that is that you take the total amount that they're supposed to get, 15000 for the year, that's what they're supposed to have paid, and you say, well, it's supposed to be 7500 in the fall and 7500 in the spring. Well, for the, you know, you take the six months of interest from the seven, for the 2500 overpayment uh, from the fall date to the spring date, 
and then you, you pick up the rem remaining amount from the spring date and just carry on forward until the date that it gets paid. I think that's how the interest is supposed to be calculated. It's how I've always understood that it's supposed to be calculated because the date of a, because when you ever pay is when you pay too much. And it is divided in two, and they require you to pay it in twice. I, I think I agree with you in theory. What I'm looking for from one side or the other, and you didn't really answer my question on it either, okay. is can somebody show me something where this has happened? I can. I have a like, So, so yeah. somebody, somebody didn't pay in October, right? Show me something that says I have done, and I think they charged interest uh, for uh, that. Uh, look, right? No, no, we can't. Not in the record, and I'll just. I think answer that or try Mike, to answer. Mike, can I, just a second. I, John was talking. I wanted to finish this point. Sorry, John. Okay. And then, I, I, and then, I, and then you can answer you. that. Thanks. Uh, right. I have Don Petron here. I can put him on the stand because he, he did not pay one of his fall one and had to pay. He actually paid it a day late and was charged uh, a dollar in interest. Right. <laughs> right. But I want to put, I just, I just you want, want me to put him yeah. on? Yeah. No, no, I just want to see it. No. I just want to see this it. Is, this is a question. Right? Time, for, time for witnesses. I just want to see it. Well, it just, it, it just, I understand that, but it is astonishing to me, and not, I'm not saying this about you, but what I'm saying is it's astonishing to me that the assessor is not just simply stipulating that if you are late in your fall payment, you get charged interest. That's not controversial. It shouldn't be controversial. It should just be a fact here. That's what happens. You know, I had no idea, and, and frankly, I think I should be allowed to put a witness on if they're really going to make that argument that it's not in the record because I had no idea that they'd be sitting here. I mean, I guess I should have known given the tone of their argument, but that's crazy. That's what happens. You can't say that that's not what happens. I will put a witness on and show it, and I should be allowed to do that. But really what should happen is we should just stipulate to that because that is exactly what happens. Now, we can argue about, you can decide whether what the effect of that is, but it's what happens, and I'd love to... I'm inclined so, to, to, to agree with them on this. Unfortunately, I think, if I'm not mistaken, you, you bear the burden of proof, so you have to prove it to me or us to that extent, so I would have to see it. And, and no offense to anybody here, I mean, that, that, that doesn't just somebody saying it doesn't do it for me. Well, okay, again, John, I just wanted to... Just and maybe I'm completely off base, and if I am, somebody tell me. We'll get to you. Um, John, I just wanted to go back to your example. Just so make well, it can, clear. can I answer that that one first? Because I, I I have another. You can you can prove his you can in a minute. Okay. But when the ten thousand dollars mm -hmm. and then the, the twenty thousand dollars it got reduced to fifteen, what should have been so it was seventy five, two payments of seventy five. Yeah. Correct. So what you're saying, if in fact they paid the ten thousand first, they've right. overpaid twenty five hundred yes. on the first right. payment. Right. right. So since they've already started the overpayment of that, they overpaid more than they should have on that first time. Right. Then that twenty five hundred should the should top the the interest should start ticking on that portion yes. of the overpayment Correct. only on that portion. and only on that portion right of the because that's the only amount right. that was overpaid and then comes the second one yes and then, and then the second half right. comes in and that's when that starts ticking okay yeah. just wanted to clear that up so we no, were that, on that's exactly what I was all right yeah. now as far as again I just point out that this is exactly what's in the town's exhibit number one is that they say, with interest to accrue upon taxes, the last page of that says, with interest to accrue upon taxes due and unpaid after each such date. After each such date means, after the two dates, that was the October and the... Wait, so my thing with that is, though, and maybe I shouldn't say this on record, but, but the, the building, I, the, uh, the deck that I put a roof on last year, Right. It also says in somewhere in the town's bylaws that they're going to make me tear it down if they come and they assess it and they see that it's there. And they didn't make me, t you know, they don't make you tear it down. They just tax you different. So, I mean, there's things in there. Can somebody show me where they actually in practice charge somebody that much money, that money there? Can I take a shot at it? Uh, yeah, because Mike, it, you've asked whether the people have said with the town stipulated. I mean, so here's, it's in black and white that they charge interest if you do not pay, based upon, okay. as they said, on each date that the payments due. So whether we have actual examples, that's actually what, what the okay. order says. But just a couple clarifying points, I think, to get back to your earlier question um, and to some of this discussion. When they're talking about charging interest, it does say uh, uh, after each such date at the rate of 7%. When it talks about overpayment, it doesn't say anything about bifurcating the dates. That's number one. Number two, which is very important, just so you are clear, what I just heard was an argument 
that based upon the due dates in the order that are set by the council, that that is when the dates of overpayment should be calculated. So I'm looking at exhibit four, for example, it just happens to be October 15th of 2015 and March 15th, 2016. There is no evidence in the record of when those payments were made. This is a general order of a due date. The failure on the part of the taxpayers is to present any evidence other than what's in exhibit seven and exhibit eight when a payment was actually made, as I explained. If you look at the column, very specific to when the actual overpayment was made. You can't rely upon a due date because we have no idea. That's the problem with coming in with 54 uh, taxpayers, is that they're, we don't know their dates of overpayment because they haven't presented that. So the only date that I think you can rely on is the date that's in our exhibits. Um, you can't go based on the general due date because they might have paid it early, they might have paid it late. There are too many of them and they didn't present the evidence. So that's, that's where I was arguing about the burden of proof and what's actually in the record. And again, frankly, taxpayers presented no evidence um, nothing new, um, no argument, other than a memo that was submitted in mediation. Um, there, there's no explanation of their position. So uh, that, was, that was on them to, to actually explain this, and they didn't. So I think the only date you can go by is the date that we actually have in the record. Okay. Thank you for that. Can I just respond to that just real quick? Yeah. That works both ways. I mean, they don't have anything that should, I mean, it's just, that's just, I, I think that's, really cutting things incredibly fine. I mean, there, there's no dispute about when things were paid. This is an interest calculation. The real issue is, is where they, where, when does the interest get calculated? That's what's at issue here, not when people were paid. The board's not gonna calculate to the date, and that's what the, the board did not calculate to the, specifically what the interest was, but the board can order that, you know, half of it's uh, charged interest from the date of the first, the date of the first payment. It's in the records, it's a ministerial act, that's not something that we should have to prove, and for the town to suggest that we do is, is, I mean, it's disingenuous and it goes right back to what I was saying again. They're just arguing, they, I mean, for the sake of arguing. That's kind of, well, that's all I gotta say. Okay, all right, thank you. I mean, we, we discuss, I know this is an important subject we're discussing the interest. However, it's really a, a minor point compared to the, the, the major issue of, of this, of the tax abatement, but, right. but an important one, I grant it. Um, other questions? Matt? I, just from a dollar point of view, what, what's the dollar amount at 31.48% that would be received? The total dollar amount? Yep. Absolutely. I can be here all night. <laughs> no, you can't. It's in the neighborhood of 1.5 before interest. Yeah. I think maybe, that's maybe up to 1.6. I'd say somewhere in between 1.5 and 1. I would 6. say it's in between 1.6 and 1.7, but it depends on the interest. Okay. We're in that ballpark. In that ballpark, yes. Yeah. Yeah. That's 20 million. I'm not holding anybody to any number. <laughs> we just want to get an idea, right? Yeah. yeah. And I can say that only we calculated it for the court. I know it's in one of our briefs. I just don't have it exactly in front yeah, of Yeah, we've calculated I mean. I just couldn't remember it off the top of my head. No, 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 absolutely. I'm just trying to appreciate if it's 2% of a billion or 20% of 100 bucks. Yep. So, so that just puts, puts real numbers in, in my head. In the neighborhood of one cent. Okay. Right. I have another question, and maybe for both of you, really. Oh, excuse me, Mr. Chairman. It's in the neighborhood of one cent, but you have to subtract that. We've already paid that. No. But it's not 1.6 in addition. We paid it to 3, 3, 395, mm -hmm. whatever that was, right? The okay. point that we've got paid 400,000. Somewhere in that room. Yeah. Ish. They paid four hundred thousand. This is one six. So be one two. Thank you. Yep. Um, I want to go to the uh, the point that um, the town made about reaffirming our decision. Just saying, listen, you know, we came here, we looked at it, and we thought we made the best decision we could at the time. You spoke a little to, to that, John. Um, I'd like you to. <laughs> Talk to me a little bit more about that. Sure. And and, and then, Mike, I'd, I'd like to, you to respond because you're the one that actually brought that argument up, if you don't mind. I just, I, I really don't think that you should or can do that. I mean, the court, we can talk about, we did talk about the two different parts of it, but the, the ultimate result was that the court rejected that resolution. 
And Superior Court said that that was unreasonable and didn't actually serve as a remedy. And then it said you can do one of these other two things. But we, you know. So uh, for the board to then go and say, well, we don't care what you said. We're going to do it all over again. I mean, what's the justification for that? I mean, you've would been we, would we? Do you feel that would be illegal? Would we would be in a getting? Would we do be doing something illegal? Would be violating a court order? Do you think it violating? Would, a court would, would it, would it ri rise to that level? It's not a violation of a court order. Well, right? that, that's the, the wrong. It's a judgment. Well, maybe it it's is, a wrong it, way it of is a it. I mean, it is a judgment. In my view, what, what's happened here is the courts come back. So you said let's do A, which is the eight percent. We go up to the court, the court says, well, you can't do A, you got to figure something else out. To then go back and say, well, we don't care, we're going to do A, because that's really what doing A again is, is we don't care what you said, judge. I mean, that's, it's, it's not violation of court, no one's going to put you in jail for doing that. But that's not really what the board is required to do here. Now, the town can, you know, no matter what you do tonight, uh, because this is all one part of one program, one proceeding, the town can always argue that your initial decision was correct, even if you make a different decision tonight. Um, and it could always argue that if it really wanted to, depending upon what the resolution that you come to tonight is. Uh, but if you were, I mean, I, I really think that if you were to go back and just simply say, well, we really think that what we did was right the first time, notwithstanding what you told us, Your Honor, that's not the way the system is supposed to work. I mean, when I advise boards, and I've advised boards before, if I were ever to, to be in a situation like yours, I would tell them, well, you need to wrestle with what the court said, and you need to, to you can't just reaffirm what you, what you did. Uh, that would be my advice, I think, because I think that the court said you could, can't do the 8%. You've got to do something different. So I think you need to wrestle with that. Okay. Thank you. Absent a change in law, if the U.S. Supreme Court decided something yesterday, right. you might change your opinion. But since nothing's changed, there hasn't been a major change in law. There hasn't been a change in facts. So that's part of what John's saying. Yes, so assuming exactly. everything else remains the same. Right. Yeah. right. And it has, right. Mike, you know, would you talk to your point about uh, the other one who raised it in your, in your remark? I think you had a... Can, can I... Oh, sorry, yeah. So in your own words, didn't you say that 14% wouldn't be really any different than the 8%? Right, because it would be replicating the same error that the court disagreed with. So would... Hypothetically, fifteen percent. Yeah, not. It would be the same thing. It would be roughly. I mean, so, where was the fifteen percent come from? So, at what point is it just the thirty-one point four eight percent that no longer replicates thirty-one percent or twenty-nine or twenty-three or? Well, I think that you have to have some actual evidence to support whatever number you're going to come up with. And so I think that if you're talking about the 14%, the problem with that is the way that number has come up with is that it, it basically takes the aggregate of dollar amount that everyone saved and then attempts to back from, a, from 34 taxpayers or 30, some, 30 plus, 30 some taxpayers in the abutting lot program and then attempts to back into a percentage to apply to 54 taxpayers who are now the ones appealing this, mm -hmm. roughly. Uh, that's the same analysis the court said you couldn't do to get to the 8%. Now, the 31.48% that I described to Mr. Herrick, how I came up with that number, uh, and that's really, so that's based on what the evidence is in front of you. And I think that's, I, I don't think there's a lot of, there's other evidence to say that it should be higher, but I actually don't think that's, actually, that's the correct decision. Um, but the, the, you know, that's what the number, ha if you're going to come up with a percentage, it has to be based upon some set of facts as to what actually happened in the abutting lot program. And the reality is, and I think what the difficulty is, is that everyone's like, oh, why should this tax group of taxpayers get so much money? But the reality is that everyone in the abutting lot program got tons of money. And it was a really lucrative, I mean, if you were in that program, it was a really lucrative thing. And so that's what we're saying. you got to we should get the same thing, and that's why you get to the. That's why the numbers sound big. It's because that's what the program was. And the number for Exhibit Five that John read from that shows the holistic thing, the average amount of it comes out to the 38, 31 point. So I, you can't just choose a number from the air. You got to choose a number from the, the record in front of you. Okay. 
Um, Thank you. You wanted me to talk yeah. about, I think, my position. Yeah. I guess, and I'd also your just, position about I would just the reaffirming piggyback on that a little bit. You absolutely need to use a number that's in the record, and that's why we've provided you the numbers that I think you should refer to. Um, as far as your original decision, again, as I've said, um, uh, we believe it was correct. Uh, the court has given you an alternative remedy um, to, to wrestle with, and I think that was maybe the phrase that was used. I mean, that's part of the issue is you then have to wrestle with what the court did and how to try to make it fit. The reason we put on more numbers and tried to explain that in a way, because again, when we were at the hearing uh, before the court and we've submitted supplemental briefs, each of us, on what the judge seemed to be suggesting uh, he thought was appropriate. This give the same tax dollar number, not, not value abatement, but tax dollar uh, uh, refund, essentially. And neither side really agreed with that. The reason we've tried to come to a solution that would fit within what the court was saying, but again, do it in a slightly different way than we did before, uh, was because we're trying to give the board the option. And that's why we've presented the evidence. So you can try to wrestle with what the court did, and we've tried to frame it in a way that you could do it. Um, I don't agree at all that the court suggested that by uh, dividing it uh, over all 54 taxpayers, or multiplying it by all 54 who are, who are plaintiffs, that that would be inappropriate. Uh, what the court said was that because we're only relying upon the lesser number in the, uh, in the joining lot program, that that was the part, and, and Mr. Peoples sort of alluded to that, that's really what the court said. That was the indefensible part according to one justice. So what we've said is, okay, multiply it out over all the taxpayers, just as the judge said, and the, then divide it up that way. Um, it would certainly be, I, I might say, a bold move uh, to stick to your guns. But as I've said uh, here, and I've put in writing, we absolutely believe that that was the right decision. Um, according to all the case law, we think it's very defensible. We're not waiving that. Uh, Mr. Schumadine was absolutely correct. If you go with the court's decision and it's somewhere in the 700,000 plus interest range, we then have the option to then appeal that and basically argue that the first, uh, our first decision here in May uh, of last year was appropriate. Um, and that's probably what we'll do. Um, but again, we've tried to present the evidence in a way that might fit within what the court suggested you do um, as opposed to just beating the same drum um, and saying the we, same did, argument. Didn't we decline it the first time and then they came back and said we had to change something, so we changed something and we asked them to give us some parameters and there weren't really any right. parameters. They so agreed with our decision and based uh, up to right. the point of the adjoining lot right. program and yeah. they wanted us to deal yeah. with that, yeah. which we're dealing right. with that now. Uh, <laughs> uh, while you're standing up, yep. uh, and you kind of touched on it, but I'd like you to talk a little bit more Attorney Schoenine basically said, listen, you know, if you take, if you go look at what you presented on that, that uh, Exhibit 9, that we're basically doing the same thing again, and it will get kicked back out or whatever. Yeah. So could you talk to that? Is, did you, obviously, you don't agree with that. I understand yeah. that. But you want, you want to tell me why we're not, we're not living a Groundhog Day here? Because yeah. it seems like it. A absolutely. Um, the if you read the, the court's decision, the court said that the reason it was indefensible was because you were dividing by a smaller number. The court suggested that if everybody that's a plaintiff on that side of the room got the same average amount, uh, average the, the amount that people in the adjoining lot program got, and then you multiply it out by the number of plaintiffs, the court was fine with that. That's why it's not Groundhog Day. The court didn't say that uh, by dividing, by backing into essentially an abatement, that that was incorrect. The court just had a slightly different way to calculate it. Um, I don't think the court said at all that you can't use an abatement. And again, I think one thing that we seem to have agreed to is you can't abate a tax amount. You have to abate the property values, which is why we've tried to use percentages so that it applies to everybody equally. We're not just talking about one taxpayer. So I don't, I don't think the court's going to find that by using the, the, the methodology and then dividing it a different way, I don't think that's going to be, that's going to be an issue. Um, just one other point really tangential to that, but I, I didn't raise it earlier. Um, the, the other side has suggested that the number is off on that Exhibit 9 uh, because we've divided by or multiplied by the wrong number of uh, uh, adjoining lot owners. The number 37 is in the court's decision, 37 adjoining properties. 
Um, the number 19 is in the court's decision because 18 people backed out of the program after year two, so in year three. Um, and that's in the court's decision. There may be arguments uh, and issues about which properties were, were correctly in the adjoining lot program. We went over that last time. The number 37 was essentially settled on. And the other thing I'd point out, the exhibit that we used, I just looked at it, which was Exhibit 8, which was Mr. Sturgis's recalculation um, of taxes after the original decision. It had 56 properties on it, I believe. Not all of those properties were in the adjoining lot program. That's why we went through uh, one by one. They can disagree, but the, the court found in the first couple pages of its decision that it was 37 um, uh, for the first two years and 19 for the next. So that's the number we used. Um, and I think it's, uh, at least based on the evidence that we have in the record, that's the best number you have to go by. I think as Mr. Herrick asked the question, I think how they get to the 17,000. Right. We, we don't really have the numbers in the record. We do have their calculation, but we've, we've tried to lay it out for you in the record, so you've got it in front of you. So, mm -hmm. so being, being in the program gives you a reduction in taxes? It, did, it, gave, it gave a reduction. What, um, what would possess someone then to get out of the program? Why would 19 people get out of the program? I just want to make sure I'm not missing something. Yeah, there, there was... I'm there was, sure they were going to win. And, and, of course, we'd have to go back to the record. But it was this was prior to... Actually, I guess the appeal, appeals had been filed, um, and some people were given the option. Do you want to stay in the program? Do you want to get out? And they chose to get out. Um, and at that point, their, both of their lots were then assessed at what you might call full value. So they're no longer in the program. Okay. And, okay. I, and I can't remember exactly they how they did it, but they bas basically they sent letters out and, and offered. Oh, that's it. You might want to buy it out, build on it, Okay. Yeah. So, anything else on that? Um, no. I'm all set. Don't. Can I respond to the Groundhog Day comment? <laughs> yeah. Because <laughs> yeah, I, sure. I think it is Groundhog Day. Yeah. I know, I mean, that's why I said it. Right. I mean, you look at what he did before. He said, okay, the total amount that the taxpayers had was X dollars, and then you divide, you know, and then you divide it by the number of taxpayers who are complaining, and basically to get to the 14%, you're doing the same thing over again. It's the same type of math. It's, you know, what if we only had two or three taxpayers? Would they be getting, you know, if we had two, would they be getting 50% of the 700,000? Again, that's exactly the type of calculation that I think the court explicitly found was a problem with the prior decision. And I think you do the 14%, you're just asking for further remand. And I, one, if I might, one last comment. As I stood up at the chart, the main constitution requires all these real estate taxes to be done on an ad valorem basis. That may not be right, it may not be fair, but it is main law. And so yes, somebody with a $10 million property gets more money than somebody with a million dollar property and more money than somebody with a hundred thousand dollar property. That's the main law under the main constitution. Hey, can I ask you something about that bill? And I, I may have this, I may not know what I'm talking about here, but. It doesn't from, stop me. So. <laughs> from, from what you said, isn't that like what the Homestead Act does? For elderly, doesn't it change their... And the reason that it is, and we have something special for farm and open space, and we have something special for wars, and it's because the people of Maine, you may not realize it, but we have amended the Maine Constitution mm -hmm. to allow certain special tax programs, current use programs. Yeah, use okay. That's because we all, probably nobody realized what they were doing, we all amended the Maine Constitution. But for our purposes here on single family homes, there is no amendment to the Maine Constitution. You're stuck with the general rule of the Maine Constitution, which is it's an ad valorem basis. That makes That's sense. So that one I didn't know. That was one. I'm one for <laughs> 10 tonight. Uh, <laughs> um, okay. Uh, I, the, uh, the comment about this is ending it, I, I don't honestly see this ending no. it. No matter Chance. what we decide, it's not going to end it. If we decide, one way, it'll be appealed. If we decide the other way, the town's going to appeal it. If we did do nothing, it will be appealed. So it will be appealed. I mean, I don't see a, an ending in sight. And, and, and quite honestly, in, from my perspective, we're a three-member Board of Assessment Review Board. This is a very kind of nuanced legal case. And uh, for the Superior Court to kick it back to us, is, you know, 
is a bit, I mean, they, they're not even giving us direction. They, they, there's some direction, but, you know, I think you time. asked for a definitive answer when, when you made your arguments. We did, and we, asked, and we actually asked for the court to make the decision. Right, and they did make a decision. They, they, they kind of bounced it back to us, which I know courts do that all the time. I'm just saying that, you know, I don't know if this is within really our scope sometimes of what they're asking us to do to look at the, this, the nuance of all this. And, and um, because I think boys, no matter what we end up deciding, it's, oh, yeah. it's going to be a... Well, some, well the some, first yeah. time, the first time they sent it back after we declined it and they said we had to change it and do what we thought was fair. Which we so did. it's almost unfair in itself, but we did, right? right? So, and, but this time they did give us a little more direction. I feel like they did a better job of giving us some kind of direction. I'll give them credit for that. A little bit. All right. Um, I guess that was kind of a, just a general comment. Okay. Any other, Matt? I, I, I'd be curious if, if you could elaborate on the, the process uh, if, if we if we vote such that it's favorable for the town how the appeal process is going to go and then vice versa so I can kind of wrap my head around we'll be seeing you guys for the next six years right um, Matt thank you for that question let me just start off by making a couple observations and comments and I'll, and I'll go right to your, to Please, your question you. this is an incredibly factually complex matter, incredibly legally complex matter. We've got a room full of attorneys. Uh, there's very little agreement on the hard legal issues. Um, and you, you can't help but um, be sympathetic to the board for ha being in the position of having to sort this out and come up with something that's both factually correct and, and legally correct. Um, I, so I think you've got to step back a little bit and get to um, some the term is used rough equality. You know, another way of saying that would be like rough justice. There used to be a, a, a judge that is retired that used to call that barroom justice. You know, almost um, like you've got to use your best judgment based on the facts and the law as you understand it to come up with an answer. I think you think you probably already did that. Um, and now that has been that question and, and sent back to you. Um, but you are um, in a position where you've got to take a side, uh, one side or the other, or someplace in the middle, or someplace uh, a, a yet another option. Um, but I think everybody gets it that they need to um, base their decision on the testimony, things in the, in the record, uh, not pull something out of thin air. I think that that was what the attempt was the last time. to base it on what, what is in the record, and you, again, should try to do that uh, as best you can. Uh, we can assist in writing up a decision uh, that includes facts and law uh, and talks about uh, your deliberation uh, so that uh, it explains the process, which you know, people certainly disagree with the outcome of the process, but certainly every effort's been made to make sure all sides were heard and, um, and vetted and everybody had the opportunity to argue strenuously. But at, at some point, the, the hammer's got to come down and you've got to make your decision. Um, where it goes from there is um, unknown. Um, but I, obviously, I think the chairman makes a good point that there could be future litigation. That shouldn't weigh into your, your decision uh, directly. Um, if you make the best decision you can based on the facts and the law, and the law uh, hopefully that will uh, result in your decision being upheld in the courts if it, if it goes, goes to the courts. Uh, but um, you really can't. That, it sort of like leaves your department and goes to the next department, and it's really not um, something you should be putting a lot of emphasis on. Um, I, I think everybody understands where we are now, though. We've been to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court has sent it back to the Superior Court. The Superior Court has sent it back to you. Uh, with a set of, uh, with, a, with a, a, a bit of commentary about what you might want to do. Uh, so there's several options. Um, you know, perhaps the most conservative uh, course would be to as uh, closely um, adhere to what the, you believe the Superior Court to be saying. To sort of toe that line to the extent that is, is, is possible. Uh, more risky would be to go with a, um, an approach that would, basically double down on your previous decision. Um, 
certainly you could make the decision uh, that the taxpayers are advocating for, uh, for a higher amount, and, and there could be a basis uh, for that as well. But I'm hoping everybody, just like you have throughout this thing, when you get to your deliberations, uh, speaks up and, and, and uh, you've, you've got a lot of questions answered, but have a, a full discussion. Um, and we can get, hopefully, the gist of uh, where you're coming from. Not a vote tonight, but uh, the gist uh, in terms of where uh, your feelings might lie. We can write something up for your consideration. Uh, I think uh, this time we will provide it to the other side uh, in advance uh, of the meeting, a, a draft. Um, so that there's no, nobody feels that there's inappropriate uh, process going on there. Um, we can provide a draft of that decision. Again, we don't decide, um, but we're giving you something that, that um, you can look at, analyze, throw out. I hope you do, you know, play around with it and, and decide where you go with it. So I guess, Mr. Chairman, really what has to happen is somebody needs to go first and yep. start talking about um, where they see this coming out and see if you can get to a consensus. If you don't, uh, you can roll this to another night. Um, we could have an executive session if you wanted to talk about uh, legal issues. We can't do any deliberations in an executive session. Right. Uh, so there's other options. Okay. So, well, I think we'll, we'll start our deliberations unless anybody has any other no. further questions. No. Um, good. Anybody? All right. Well, I'm, I'll start unless you, someone wants to. No, we questions. encourage you to start. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Well, you, um, well I, I think, you know, I guess my initial feeling when I got here was, was I was, after reading the court's decision and listening to what they're saying, kind of kicking it back to us, um, and, you know, basically saying that our relief, um, they, they invalidated our remedy, not necessarily our relief. And, and, and it says in that first part of the um, uh, Justice Horton's decision, the first variable, the dollar amount saved by the underassessed taxpayers, is relevant to determining a reasonable abatement because it measures the extent of the discriminatory practice. Basing abatement to remedy discrimination upon the extent of the benefit conferred by the discriminatory practice is certainly reasonable. So, you know, we might have got a home run, but we certainly got a, hit, a single on that one. I think we, um, so that part was right. And, 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 I, and as I said earlier, I think that um, it certainly is not going to end here tonight with us, no matter what we decide, you know, my, my feeling is. And, and I really think that this issue, this complex issue, and as, as um, Gerwood had pointed out, it takes some, you know, we have, we have, we have a number of attorneys here and, and no one can come to an agreement on it and, it's in, and we're kind of, you know, trying to dance on the end of a penhead here. So I think that, uh, I, I really feel the ultimate decision should be for each of these lawyers to argue in front of the law court or wherever you want to be and let, let uh, uh, a learned panel decide this thing. And, and, but I know that's not where we are. I know it's back to us and they want us to make this decision granted. So we're going to do our best, but, you know, don't put your files away, gentlemen. So, <laughs> um, <laughs> Well, you charts and graphs. Because it won't end here. I'll say that again. So I, I think that um, I like the Exhibit 9 for the town because I think that it, it doubles what we initially offered them plus interest. Uh, I think I, I don't know if, it's, if we're recreating the same thing because of the aggregate and um, issue. Um, and... If we are, then they'll tell us again. And I think it's a, uh, it brings a total abatement up to like $770,000 uh, for those um, participants in the program. The, um, which is not an insignificant number based on what's happened in a, in a program that was, that was standard here and other, other other towns until it went to the court and they looked at it and said no. So um, I think something should be done. 
Uh, I initially, like I said, I thought maybe my after reading everything, I was going to say, hey, listen, since it's going to be heard again anyway, any decision we make is, is going to be um, addressed by one party or the other. Even, even if we did nothing, it would be addressed. So um, I think that, uh, and I'm, but I'm not after hearing uh, the arguments against doing nothing, and, and I don't think that's probably the, the, the right way to go. I agree that, you know, it, it does give us some direction that says this is okay here, but this isn't okay here. So, and it wouldn't be, you know, I don't feel it would be right to, to send it back to the, the court and say, listen, we, we think we, we got it right. Uh, in the face of you telling us we didn't. So, um, based on that, um, I, I'll opt towards the, leaning towards the, uh, the uh, town exhibit nine, where we recalculate, and get the aggregate, which comes out roughly when you look at it, a 40% abatement for those properties. So. That's kind of where I stand up, elaborating any further. Does the 14% uh, equate to the 770? Or is, is that 77, 770 plus the 400? That they no, that's, already, that's the total. The total. Less the, the, they've already been paid 395 plus interest, I believe. Okay. Right. I think those checks have gone out. Yeah. Were the checks yeah. sent out? And just, just to be clear, this, it's 698 is 14 percent. The interest is on top of that. Yeah. Calculated okay. in the chart, I think it's three percent. Yeah. Um, and I would, and I would, I'll, I'll add to that. I think that, um, um, again, the, this is another issue that is going to be argued, irrespective of what we do, because I, my feeling, because again, is it's a, what is the right answer? What is the right legal answer? You know, I'm not trained legally. So, so on, on, on that, was it the 770 net of the amount paid, or does it? And, and let me also just clarify. That's the total, if you do the math. 395 was 8%. 698 is 14%. So if you use the number 770, we've already paid 460. So the additional payment would be 310. Okay. Right, right. You're doing my math. That's the total number. Yes. Of which some has already been paid. And you haven't decided on the interest yet. I'm talking about that now. So, um, again, that I feel that that's another issue, as like this issue is going to be um, never agreed on to, to what extent. The timing, when does it start, when does it start, what's that day? Does it, you know, certainly, I certainly agree with um, the, the, uh, the taxpayers about, you know, if you're a day late, you're paying, you're paying interest charge. I agree with that. Because we all do, and we all... We all, it happens, right? And um, so I'm not sure, again, when is it over, when is it late, when is it, when do you hit that threshold or not? Um, the, but the town does have a charter. We didn't know that at the time. We do know that now. We are looking at it again. We are taking another bite of the apple. So I think we have every right to, to, to look at what, what's available in front of us, whether it wasn't delivered to us initially sure. or not. And the, the town has, in its budget order, says 3%. So good, good, bad, or indifferent, that's what the town charges. So I think we also, we ought to stay in sync with that number and not do anything different. If we knew that the time we're putting this together, it would have been 3%, in my opinion. I would have voted for 3% because that's what it was. So um, I'd say we, we go up to 3% to be in line so it's not out of the order, out of any ordinary that anything else, and it's, and it's in writing in the town budget order, so I think we ought to stay consistent with that. Um, I'm, I'm going to actually go a slightly different direction, and I, I think... I think the seven percent interest is probably fair. The, the town itself made the mistake of not being able to present that information accurately and clearly in the beginning. Um, that was their their mistake. Uh, I know that if Skyro Pity is going to pull me over and I'm going to get a ticket, I'm going to look for a loophole to get out of that ticket. And if, and if they forget to sign the ticket, and that's my way out. 
Um, if they don't do their job, they don't do their job, and there's a penalty for that. And there clearly was a minor penalty. Um, as far as the overall percent, um, I'm, I'm not able to wrap my head around 31.48. I, I am wrapping my head around a, a lower number um, consistent with what the town has uh, with 7% interest. Okay, so you're saying 770 with a higher interest rate, 7%? Uh, I, no, I, I think that the number is the 698 plus the 7%. Is that? Yeah, 698 which plus the 7%. A, which would be the total of 770. Is that correct? No, 698, the total 7, 770 includes a 3% interest. Oh, 3%. Okay, then I, I apologize. So okay, it, yeah, it would I'm be sorry. 698 so I, I would, plus I the 7%. Going, I would be going higher to the 7%. Okay. Yep. And, and, and that's because that's that was that was originally presented. That's what everyone believed was the number. It was just, unfortunately, not followed up on the confirmed. Okay. All right. Chris. So... I hope they never ask for this. There's a lot of scribbling on here. <laughs> um, and some of it I am going to pass over because it's just my thoughts. But important thoughts are um, I have to go home tonight and go to bed, and I have to wake up in the morning the next day. So I need to, for myself, make sure that I've done this right, whether it's coming back or not. I need to, I need to feel like I didn't waste everybody's time. Um, I don't agree at all with 31%, um, and I have on here just a couple notes, a quote unquote averaged, um, and then I, I went back up to another spot, um, and I agree with what you said about we should it, sh it should have nothing to do with an average, and then you said something about that, and that, that swayed me back down over the edge to, to I can't go with a 31. Um, As far as the percentage, the, I, I, th I feel like the courts must have some kind of way that they're going to measure that and come up with it for us. But again, I still feel like I have to come up with a decision so that I can say that I made some form of decision. Um, but I think in the end that they will probably come up with what that is going to be, I would assume, at some point. And they're just going to hard, steadfast, say that's the way it is. So good. I hope they do. I'd also like to say that uh, Justice Horton, did a much better job this time than the people last, or whoever it was before, when we specifically asked them, if, if you don't like what we're coming up with for an answer or a decision, give us something more to go by. Help us come with, why are we wrong? Give us some way to fix that, and I'll fix it. I, I'm not gonna take it personal that you said I was wrong the first time or the second time. But they're smarter than I am, I guess, and, and so be it. Um, that said, I, I really do feel like they kind of backed their way into 14% by saying the 698,000 um, minus the 350 paid, so on and so forth. Uh, and, and in the end, I'm going to go with the 3% on the interest based on what I saw in front of me. I, I would say, though, I think it needs to go on the first date, not the back. I don't know if that's relevant or not, but. It should go on that front date, not the back first, date. First payment date. Yeah, the first payment date, not the back date. And that's. And what number are you looking at? Us. I didn't hear that. The six ninety eight. Six ninety eight. And and where I'm pulling my numbers, I guess town, Exhibit Nine backed up what I what I read from Justice Horton. Okay. So it, that's what I wanted to see, and I know they, they ask us to put as much why we come to something in our mind. Why did why did I think this, right? That's why I think it was from just Justice Horton. I felt like that they were leading us in that direction, um, and Exhibit Nine backed up Justice Horton slots. All right. So. Pretty much, we don't really have quite an one, one, one of the questions, staying on the interest, uh, is 
whether you felt you heard enough record evidence about when the payments were made. I think one of the factual questions here is this Exhibit 9 is based upon the assumption that the date of overpayment was at the time of the second payment, not earlier. And the lawyers That's very much point. disagree mm -hmm. on that. Um, but the town is saying that there's no way of that for them to prove their position right, that they, you know, w when they paid, and so when did the payment, the only way to calculate it is at the second, at the second payment based on the evidence in the record. That's for you to decide, but I just flag that as, a, as an issue. That's a really good point. If I paid late my taxes down in Scarborough, yeah. wouldn't there be a record of them charging me a late payment? Yeah, there certainly would, but it's not necessarily tonight. in the record here. Oh, in this record. Uh, right. It is, in, well, it is right. somewhere in this building. <laughs> there's a computer or something that, that says when you paid, <laughs> but in these proceedings, I mean, these guys know the record. Can I just but say so that I thought yeah. last time we all just said that this was a, that was a ministerial act that could just be figured out, and that's pretty much where I thought we were last time. As far as when people paid, I mean, there's a record of it. Um, but it's not being figured out. And, and, it, and it didn't that happen. Lot. So that, and I was actually well, just no, going to say that, and I, I'm not sure, are they, should they, this is just between us now, right? Yeah. Right. So... Last time we did that, and what he just said is correct. We had it. Well, this you guys can figure that out behind the scenes, and then but it didn't happen, right? And then something came back at us, and and for us we have to use things like, well, was there really thirty one on graph, and are we disputing that graph B had thirty and not thirty two? We have to use what we can best come up with out of that, right? So, but that said, can we can we make them go back if and, and, and I mean I mean that's kind of rude of us I think to an extent. There might be a way we can write that, and maybe that's something you could leave to me to um, come up with some options for you at the next time. That uh, you you you, you get you, you get the concept. I can give you a, a couple of concepts uh, on how yeah. that might play out. Chris and I are are, are on the three percent. Matt wants the seven percent. Chris wants three percent starting on the. First payment day. Well, I, you know, I, you know I'll, I mean, I may take that back a little bit, especially because that you you brought up another good point about we don't know when paid what what not. If if it could be proven, I'd be more apt to go back. If you could prove that they actually paid on the front rather than the back, then I and I, and I'm not going to let that hold it up. Can I either. ask you what I mean, it matters? I, have to go. I mean, we we know that the due date is a specific day in time. That's when it's paid, whether it's received. Two weeks early or three weeks late. What does that change? The interest. The interest. The amount of money they get paid out. But it, it could work in our favor. Work. In the and city's favor, time. it could work against us if fifteen people paid three weeks early compared to fifteen people paying five weeks late. Fifteen people getting paid three weeks early. They're they're not paying interest. They're not giving them interest if they pay early. Right. Yeah, you get nothing for paying early. You get nothing early. for paying early. I mean, but that's you get, you get in anything. Nobody's going to give you money for paying early. In, in anything you're paying, your car insurance, your... I still think it should be something that they should work out together. And yeah, we, I would agree with that. you got to make a decision, but I mean, and that's why I'm... Again, this interest issue is going to be argued from... Now it's going to go from 3% to 25% in front of a judge, basically. We're, well, I don't we're agree with the 25 we're, we're, really, we're out of bit. I don't agree. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's, I that, that could be an argument well. that they've already addressed to us, right? Yeah. And any, anywhere in between, 3, 7, 25. Yeah, I, I, um, I don't know if there's a great argument for 25. I think there's a great argument for 7. Um, I think there's a, a marginal argument for 3. Um, we made the mistake, someone made the mistake of stating 7 without confirming it. Um, that was... Already well, writing. yeah, but that becomes irrelevant when it got bounced, bounced back to us. So now we have to re-decide anyways. We, we don't decide based on anything that happened last time, per se. The cop is stopping you again. Right? I agree. It stopped you the first time. And if, we, and, if, and if we didn't do anything, then it should stay at 7. But if the stop, cop stopped you a second time, then it's a whole new ballgame. It's another bite of the apple. Things changed, just as they can go after 25% now, if they want to. So things change. Yeah. So, 
I just uh, that's why I, I opt for three. Not that it would in there, but it would be, it's for the sake of putting it out there to mm -hmm. take it to to mm -hmm. the the uh, superior court and um, and and to be, I think more importantly, to be in congruence with the budget order of the town of Scarborough, and which what it would do would fall in compliant with everything else that's out there. Yeah, and I think that's important. Uh, and and if it makes a difference, I'd go to that to that second date of the year based on it. Unless something could be calculated to show it, and if we're in the best interest of that, nobody wants to start doing all those calculations, which it doesn't seem like that they ever gets agreed upon. Uh, then I think it, it, if you weren't going to go to the penny and calculate all that out, then you do need to go to the second date. If you want to calculate it out to the penny, go to the first date. But so I can fall in line with that. Okay, so Mr. Chairman, uh, it seems to be some consensus. It's not a vote around uh, adopting the sort of the methodology of uh, Town ex Exhibit Number Nine with a three percent interest. You could obviously change your mind at the next meeting, um, and if you haven't decided anything, you, the, the discussion on the interest could could toggle back and forth any any way you want. The the amounts could go back and forth, but give you something that lays out the history here, not too much detail, but so that if somebody reads this thing in five or ten years, they understand, you know, where you were and what, what you did and the position you were in and how you came up with your decision based on how you heard the evidence. Mm -hmm. So not too long, not too short, uh, something that is, gives a record um, for the court to look at. And, and I was happy to see the court didn't criticize anything about the way you phrased your decision or that you left something out. <laughs> there was no issue about the findings of the... Uh, we all got secret memos from the court. Right. 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 Can you, you, you put something? You put something yes, I'll put something together. You're going to decide when you want to meet. Uh, I guess that along, belongs a lot to uh, Tracy. That will be the next time on the agenda before you, like, adjournment. So? That will be the next item before we yeah, adjourn. Right. <laughs> but I'll get it. I'll get it to you, a bit, you know, several days in advance. Yeah. So you know. something. Or we yep. Yeah. Uh, I, I just like to something right now, right? Yeah. Can I point out everybody here? Right. Can I point out as well that I think last time we did one of these, uh, where after Derwood had written his, that we actually met during the day. I don't know if that works better or worse for you guys. I just want, I mean, wanted to throw that out that we, we are, that is available for the lawyers, obviously. Right. But obviously it has to meet your, what your availability is. Chris, can you do that? Yeah, I, I, yeah, I can. Okay. And Matt, can you do that? You're flexible, right? During the day? Yeah. Did you have a specific date? We're going to try to find one. Yeah, days are great. Yeah. Okay. All right. I'll make it work. Yeah, I that can do the same. The so right. maybe we can do that and we get, that way we're not, Having too much, uh, we're not competing with other, other groups in the room, right? Are we going to go into June? Uh, yeah, I'm going to June. You want the beginning of June? You want to look at the middle of June? Uh, Dora, how much time do you need? That's what, I mean, that's... I don't know how much time Right, that, yeah. basically yeah. that's it. Um, you know, and then, you know, like, give us to the next Thursday? No. <laughs> no. no, next Thursday we can, like, have, like, a, a draft for you in the middle of, you know, late next week. Okay. We'll give us a week to, to get the holiday and everything coming up. Yeah. Right. What about, uh, how about that second week in June from, like, the 11th to the 15th? Like, just give you plenty of time and... Uh, Thursday and Friday, and then, uh, Wednesday and Thursday we're booked uh, 12, Tuesday 12? the 12th. I can't do I won't be here on the 12th. All you right. can do it on the 12th, but I won't be here on the 12th. So we need well, we, we'd like to have we you. We can do uh, the, um, 15th? The, the 15th, yeah. If you wanted to do during the day, you yeah. could do I, any I time can't. up until 6 p.m. I thought you had, I thought I you had Wednesday, Thursday. I can't do Thursday and Friday. No. You can't do Thursday and Friday, all right. This is a Wednesday the 13th. All right. Oh, 13th? Yep. Um, I can't do that. No, I thought you can't do that already then. <laughs> Tuesday. Tuesday the 19th. Tuesday the 19th. Tuesday the 19th. <laughs> Bill? Tuesday John. the 19th. Yeah. Afternoon? We have to be out by 5.30 up here. Oh, yeah. Yeah, maybe like 3? 
Uh, John? Oh, man. Mike? I'm supposed to be in a trial that week, that the first part of that week, but I'm second chair, so I'm not sure if I could do that. Okay. That, is that whole week? That whole week? No, it's just Monday, Tuesday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. So I could be Mr. Thursday. Chairman, as we think about daytime, it doesn't necessarily have to be 10 in the morning. It could be 5 o'clock at night. So there's some of us have meetings during the day. You folks who are on your way home at 5 o'clock. Well, the thing about 5, um, there's usually the room will be, st be taken, if it is taken, like 5, 30, or 6. And so if we wanted to do 5, we had the June 26th and June 27th are wide open. 26th and 27th, at which? Night. At night. Okay. Well, M day. Yeah. June twelfth was discussed, but Tracy was unavailable. We can certainly provide additional uh, support staff if that. Is okay. June twelfth. June twelfth. Can you do twelve? Yes. Yeah. Twelfth. Anybody else? Except for ten to eleven, I can do the twelfth. All right. So we'll do it early afternoon. June twelfth. Matt, twelfth. Nope. You can't do it. <laughs> 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 Kidding. <laughs> Actually, if you did during the well day, done. That, I can that do this might be available. Well, <laughs> so, so June 12th at what time? Right, let's make June 12th at, uh, let's do it right after lunch, say 1 o'clock. June 12th at 1 p.m. Okay. Everybody in concur with that? Yeah. All right. All right. June 12th at 1. All right. Is there any other business doing to be brought up here no. tonight? Well, thank you. You'll right. send out a notice of that, right? Yep. Yep. Okay. Thank you, every, everyone, for being here tonight. I uh, officially adjourn this meeting. Thank you. 1 p.m. Yes.